spring 2007, Baghdad, Iraq. I refused to acknowledge myself in the mirror as I began washing the crimson smears of a dying man's blood from my arms and face. I moved methodically as if it would clear the fog of shock that encompassed me. I tried to silence the sound of his agonizing streams, screams that still echoed in my head. A burning sensation on my face caused me to pause. I leaned closer to my reflection and saw a gash running across my cheek under my right eye. I stood still for a moment, trying to imagine what could have caused the cut. And then I realized. The skin on my face had been torn by fragments of another man's skull. Fragments that were embedded into the flesh of my own hands. And in that instance, I stood frozen, feeling the image searing itself into my memory. My mind couldn't process the horror I felt, but I knew that I'd never be the same again. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is a former Army Captain Infantry Officer. He served two combat tours in Iraq. He was awarded the Bronze Star with Valor with an additional Bronze Star for service. He's the author of Legion Rising, which is a gripping tale of some of the toughest fighting at the height of the Iraq War. He's also the founder of the Legion 8 Foundation, which is essentially a nonprofit that is in support uh, of other veteran nonprofits, which I really like that idea um, of just raising money for other other causes that need it. There's, there should be more of that, and uh, I commend you for doing that. He's also the most dangerous car, car salesman in history. Keep that in mind next time you go joyriding at CarMax. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Jeff Morris. Good to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I appreciate you coming. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's nice that we live uh, in fairly close proximity, given the uh, social distancing bullshit that's going on. Right yeah, now. yeah. I don't know. I think we may be under the the ten feet. Yeah, yeah, we are. Here, so. but we're also under the ten person rule too, right? Yeah, there so, you go. There you go. Uh, we'll we'll bathe in hand sanitizer <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick minute to uh, thank our sponsor, which is Origin Labs, aka Jocko Fuel. Let me tell you a little bit about Jocko Fuel is that uh, it will turn you into a sexual Tyrannosaurus. I know that for a fact. Uh, they have a number of supplements. They just came out with Cold War also, uh, which is a, a great supplement, especially given uh, the times that we're in right now in terms of immune support and helping fight off colds and viruses. Uh, go to originlabs.com or uh, just search Jocko Fuel and you'll see all of the great products. Uh, they've been a long ran- running sponsor of the Mic Drop podcast, and we're super appreciative of Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel for both all the products that they put out that I take a number of them, as well as their steadfast support for the uh, for the podcast. So thank you to Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs. Uh, what is the douchiest officer thing that you've ever done? Oh, God. There's that many. <laughs> no, the first thing that comes to my mind are the things that you would probably be shocked that officers do, one of which being the ongoing text thread going on right now with me and a few of my old captain buddies yeah yeah i guess more more so like on active duty like whether it's pulling rank or you know just the the thing that that enlisted guys would roll their eyes at as as an enlisted guy yeah 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 i mean there's certain things you gotta i mean me and my guys were tight you know i was with them yeah. for the most part two deployments but sometimes you know yeah. you gotta be the guy yeah and i would say the douchiest thing is you know, we would have recall formations sometimes and guys, they were supposed to, they were going to go outside the 150 or the 50 mile, whatever radius it was, they were supposed to get a pass. And we got when the guys weren't doing it. And one night we had a, a reel, it was around Katrina. And so we did a recall formation. A lot of guys showed up late for it. So my first sergeant smoked the hell out of everybody and, you know, don't do this shit again. Well, then we got when they were doing it again. So one night just to be an asshole, uh, and in my defense, it wasn't my idea, but I took credit for it. Uh, they said, all right, Friday night, 1130, call all the guys in. And so we did the recall formation. They had an hour, hour and a half, whatever it was. And, you know, 75% of them come stumbling in, shit face drunk. And, 
you know, like 10 guys didn't show up because they had gone to South Texas to see their girlfriend or whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, so everyone hated my guts and, oh man, how could that guy be such an asshole? But, uh, you know, it's, there's a lesson learned in that and, yeah. uh, they, they more than made up for it with a pound of flesh. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can appreciate that. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be fucking held accountable, especially when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, what's the most embarrassed that an enlisted guy has ever made you? So I guess it was maybe my third day in Iraq and you know, I'm the, I'm the FNG, the new guy, you know, so I, I got to, to hood about a month, about a month after the unit had already deployed over to Iraq. So I show up, I'm the new guy and this enlisted guy, the sergeant's walking me around and you know, I'm trying to act like I know what the hell I'm doing when I don't. And he's like, well, Hey, let's walk over here. Let me show you where the aid station is. And as we're walking, we're talking, I'm kind of, looking over to his right and I see out of the corner of my eye one of those window AC units and you know I just glanced back and I thought I timed it where I could duck down in time and I didn't and I ducked down and the corner of it just caught my head <laughs> gashed my head open you know I, and I'm trying to act like I mean it hurt like hell as you can imagine but I'm trying to act tough in front of this dude and he was like you know, sir are you all right and I'm like yeah yeah I'm good I'm good and then I just feel the blood like coming down he's like sir I gotta get you in the aid station right now I'm like no man I'm good I'm good and he was just like sir we're going to the fucking aid station. So <laughs> that's fucking priceless. Yeah. What uh, What's your favorite MRE? Oh, uh, Fudge Brownie would be the. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Love that. That was a great, great bartering tool. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's the best trade you ever got for that? Uh, an entire meal for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, usually it was the opposite. It was me giving up the entire meal to get the yeah. Fudge Brownie. Sometimes. <laughs> and, yeah. But now that thing, man, it could. Uh, we always laugh. We're like, man, that enough calories in that thing and yeah. uh clog you up for a few days yeah. it's like trying to shit a billy club out sideways <laughs> <laughs> after one of those yeah if you got the shits have a, have yeah. a fudge brownie yeah what's uh what's the most pleasant memory you have uh of your time in iraq you know i mean we can get you know the, the bond the brotherhood and all that but i just remember just sometimes it would be early in the morning some coming up and it sounds crazy but you would hear the prayers from the mosque and it was just so peaceful yeah, just sitting around outside sometimes having a cup of coffee or late in the evening after a mission. I just remember that that dusk and dawn. The prayer sometimes was yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, the pregnant pause. Yeah, what uh, what do you miss most about being active? Yeah, the guys, obviously, the bond, the brotherhood. But uh, you know, not to sound like that guy, but the rush, the yeah. action. You know, there's nothing. I mean, I love my wife, I love my children, <clears throat> but from a standpoint of me personally nothing will ever replicate the the rush of combat would it help if your kids like ran by sneak attack ninja kick you in the nuts <laughs> they do that anyways they man that. yeah <laughs> you gotta meet my four-year-old that kid oh, is imagine. Imagine. yeah yeah the only apple doesn't fall far from the tree right yeah that's what they say yeah what uh what does your morning routine look like yeah i'm a i'm an early riser get up every day kind of have to with so many kids but i get up between four thirty and 5 each day and Depending on the day, two or three days a week, I got a buddy that comes over. I got a little garage gym built out. We go out and do our workout. The first other, thing? Yeah, first yeah. thing. Do you yeah. eat or drink anything before? I have a little uh, pre, pre-workout pre drink. You know, that thing, it's just a shot of 300 milligrams or what of caffeine, and yeah. that'll, that'll clean you out real quick. Get you, nice and, yeah, get you ready yeah. for the workout. So, yeah, do that, then go work out. And on the days he doesn't come over, the wife and I, we got a Peloton. and yeah. So I get my workout in early. How, how is that? Is that thing fucking... Man, I, it was her idea, yeah. and she used to teach spin, and you know she wanted to get a bike. So she whips your ass on that thing. Actually, I whip her ass now. Yeah, right? I, I use it more <laughs> than she does now. And so at first, I'm like, all right, it's something to kind of supplement. I wanted to get a rower for the garage, and she's yeah. like, no, we spent too much money on all your all your bars and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so we got the Peloton, and I started using it, and you know the first few days, that thing, I, I laughed. My neighbor was just like, well, how is it, man? And I said, dude, after sitting on that bike for 45 minutes, it's like the, the boys from Cell Block D got a hold of me, man. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta build up some tolerance to that thing, yeah. but it's a great workout. It really yeah. is. Is, is the, uh, like the picture and the, the feeling like, is it, does it replicate being in, in those places enough to where there's at least some refuge from, uh, sitting in your fucking garage? Like, is that, does that thing trick you enough to, for it to be pleasant or is it just total bullshit? No, nah, this one, it's not pictures. You're not on a, it's oh, not like you. the Nordic track where you're going and, you know, riding over the golden gate bridge or something. This I is just you. an instructor yelling at you, telling you what yeah. to do. And fuck that. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, some, there's some good eye candy. Yeah. There, so <laughs> you, you may reconsider if you see yeah. some of those instructors. Well, but it's all virtual anyway. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, you might as well go to a strip club, right? <laughs> The uh, in terms of what, once you're finished with that, um, do you go right into work? Do you hydrate? Do you eat? What uh, what's the next hour or two look like? Yeah, usually we'll have a you know some kind of protein shake or something afterwards. Take a shower and then just all hell breaks loose. The kids yeah. get up and my wife works full time. I work full time. She works from home, luckily. Uh, so it's just get the kids up, get them ready, go to daycare, and most days she takes them. Then I go yeah. and do the commute. How bad is uh, schools being closed kicking your ass right now? Dude, it is. Fucking brutal, huh? Yeah, I was, like, I was telling somebody, I'm like, send me back to back. That, man. This, <laughs> yeah. You know, the weekend's one thing. We kind of got our routine down. To, yeah. uh, you know, so we got, I got the 13 year olds down. I got a four year old, a two, well, he turns two in two days. Yeah. And then an 11 month old. Yeah, that's fucking brutal. Yeah. 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 At, at those ages, it's tough. My, my kids are a little older, so I, I actually fucking. I really enjoy the time of them being home, and they, they started doing online training uh, or online school. I guess so they they knocked that out. But I, to me, it's it's nice to take advantage of time to you know work out with them and hang out with them yeah. and, and do things, yeah. especially because there's really nowhere to go. You know, so I, I like taking advantage of that time and, and spending time with them and doing shit that you wouldn't normally get to do. But mm-hmm. uh, so I, I like it. But <clears throat> but I can see you know at, at a really young age that that's tough. But. Um, all right, so in going through your book, I know the answer uh, to most of these questions, but I want to talk in just to build a little bit of backstory for the listener. Okay. Uh, in terms of, uh, you can just kind of talk about where you grew up and, and uh, hearing about or reading about, rather, some of the, the influences, especially of your mom and, and getting divorced uh, at, a, at a fairly early age and your older brother and, and just all of the kind of tribulations that you went through that for sure shaped where you're at now i'd love if you could kind of walk us through uh that that childhood experience yeah so i was i was born in alabama but we moved to florida when you I was a roll from, tide guy uh, yeah in my family you had to be yeah, they'd, <laughs> yeah. they'd kick you out although i got older and kind of bucked the trend and thought i'd become a florida state fan oh crazy uh, yeah but uh so yeah so we moved to florida when i think when i was three and yeah. my parents split when i was five and my my older brother he was seven they had actually gotten divorced once before, like not long after I was born. Really? Got divorced, and then turned around and got remarried. Uh, I always ask my mom, I'm like, why? But hey, they did it. But I don't remember any of that. So yeah, man, it was a uh, it was tough going. You know, single mom. She bartended, uh, waited tables at night, and just picked up odd jobs here and there to to make ends meet. We lived in a tiny apartment uh, there in Destin. You know, and people get this idea of Destin, Florida, you man, you're on the beach, resort town, and People have to work in those nice resorts, yeah. and that was that was my family. Yeah. So yeah, you know, as a kid, you don't you don't know any different. I mean, this is what life is. But I think back now, and I'm like, you know, God, what what would someone do? You know, nowadays they'd get reported to child protection services. I mean, my mom would go to work, you know, feed us dinner, go to work, bartend, and the security guard of the apartment complex would come by and check on us. And we're six and eight years old, you yeah. know, staying at home alone. Yeah. So you kind of got to learn to fend for yourself. Uh, Started getting into sports, and um, my mom, my stepdad now, he was actually uh, my first baseball coach way back when. And they dated for several years, and he was a lot younger than my mom. You know, he didn't try to play dad. He was just like, you know, hey, man, I'm here. What can I do to help yeah. out besides be a coach? Yeah. But yeah, man, you know, we grew up not much. Uh, I was the athletic one. The, I think the divorce hit my older brother a lot harder. Mm-hmm. You know, he was closer with my dad, and I think he got what was going on. I didn't really get it. So he was kind of introverted, you know, great guy, you know, one of my best friends to this day, just total polar opposites in yeah. everything that we did. Well, I'm, I'm curious on the, you know, I guess on the the toughness of growing up like that. And, and you know, you talked about how in today's day and age it'd be child protective services. I, you know, to me, there's, there's an element of um, growing up that way or, or parts of that way, I think that are incredibly beneficial. Of course, there's a happy medium and that, yeah. uh, but I think there's, there's too many instances now where kids are too protected and, and too safe and, and live too much in a bubble to where it, it doesn't adequately prepare them for the real world once yeah. they, once they move out. And they, yeah. you know, to me, like I'd rather they do some dumb things while they're under my roof and, and I have the ability to to talk with them about it and, yeah. and make corrections and, and let them learn some hard lessons that are that are a little bit more calculated and, and allowed versus you know them having no real fucking concept of danger or 
uh, or you know given the the autonomy to make a shitty decision and and live with the consequences mm-hmm. while you can kind of manage them I don't, I don't think that there's enough of that but for you to to kind of reflect on it back now how how has that impacted how you as a father are are kind of treating and raising your kids is it are you overcorrecting or do you try to pull some lessons from that or how how's that working no i i definitely draw back on that you know i'm in a better position than you know, my mom was, you know, to raise my kids, just financially speaking, I should say. Uh, but yeah, man, I try to, you know, my, my 13 year old, I told you, you know, when he comes up now, it's not, you know, I know a lot of other dads in my boat, every time they see their kid, you know, it's, oh, let's go to a Rangers game. Let's go to a Cowboys game. And it's like a little vacation every time they see him. And I'm like, no, man, when you come up here, you got chores, you got stuff to do. It's not sit around and play the video game all day. You know, my other kids are young, four, two, almost one. Yeah. You know, it's a little hard, but yeah, man, I'm strict on them. Yeah. And they need to see that, uh, you know, they may have more things than I had growing up, but they're damn sure not coddled, I'll tell you yeah. that much. Yeah. No, that's good to hear. I, I don't think there's enough of that. But uh, in terms of your older brother and you growing up, did you guys play sports? He did it first. You know, he actually he was playing baseball and sports weren't really his thing. He was uh, the artistic musician in the family. And, you know, I can't draw a damn stick figure, but yeah. So yeah, so baseball, started out playing baseball and just kind of naturally had a knack for that. And I think we were on the same team for two years together. Yeah. And then uh, he quit playing sports after that. And then I played a little bit of city league football. Wasn't crazy about it. Baseball was kind of my thing. But yeah, every day I was out in the yard, football, yeah. you know, with my friends. <coughs> Did you uh, do much uh, hunting or shooting at all? No, no, mm-hmm. I had no, none. I mean, no growing up influence. No, no, you know. My, my stepdad, even though he was from West Virginia, had done a lot of hunting early on when he lived up there, but you know, we lived on the beach. You know, yeah. No one's, not a whole lot of places to go hunting around there. I guess if you go up to a little bit further north there was into southern Alabama. Yeah. But yeah, no, it was, uh, heck man, I was probably 12, 13 years old before I shot a gun for the first time. Yeah. So does that have an impact on, uh, like with your 13 year old and, and when your younger kids get a little older, is that something that you make a point to do with them or? Yeah. Yeah. The 13 year old, uh, you know, again, like I said, he lives down in Austin, but he's up here a pretty good bit. And last year, uh, took him out and he had shot before with his mom one time. And then she told me that, you know, she found some YouTube videos on his phone of, like how to make a gun and you know, just, you know, a kid just being, you know, curiosity. But, you know, I figured it was time. In fact, she was the one that brought up to me. She was like, you know, he needs to learn to respect this thing. This isn't some damn video game. Yeah. Uh, so she's like, next time he's up there, I want you to scare the shit out of him. So I, you know, some people call me father of the year. Some people say it was a crazy thing, but yeah. you know, we, I pulled my gun out and showed it to him and you know, I'm like, Oh, you, you think you're all cool. All right. Show me how you load this thing. Show me how you clear it. Yeah. You know, you, if you know so much from watching a YouTube video and he was getting nervous and then this is where people say I was the best or worst dad in the world. I pulled out some pictures and I'm like, you need to see this is what, you know, you're out dicking off with your friends one day. You know, this is what can happen. Yeah. And, you know, he started crying and, and then I'm like, all right, we're cool. You're not in trouble. I just want you to respect the power of this thing. And, you know, we're going to go get you lessons, not dad taking you out in the woods to go shoot. You know, you're going to have someone, not me, teach you how to do this. So, and he loved it. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Shot. And I'll do the same thing with the other boys when, yeah. when they get older. Um, one of the things that you do uh, growing up that I, in, in reading about it, I guess, is that you took on a lot of responsibility kind of on your own. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, I mean, to me, that seems like something that's a little bit uh, you either kind of have it or you don't. I know that the, the situation that you were in, you know, drove a lot of that, but there's plenty of kids that would be like, Sweet, nobody's here. I'm gonna fucking you know, you know, bl- yeah. bl- just fuck off and get into trouble and, and whatever. What uh, can you kind of dissect why that happened? I think probably instinctive be uh, is what I naturally go to. But you know, like I said, my my brother kind of early on school didn't come as natural. You know, he had to work really hard at it. School just for whatever reason came very easy to me and made good grades and. You know, I would kind of see my mom, you start to figure things out, you know, and oh, we don't have electricity for a day, something happened, you know, and it doesn't take long to figure out that, oh, we didn't have enough money to pay the bill. And I would see my mom stressing out about <clears> stuff <throat> and I never wanted her to stress about me. So I just took on this responsibility of, you know, not that I'm going to be the man of the house or anything, but uh, I'm going to give her one less thing to worry about. She's got enough on her plate. Yeah. 
Did uh, did that cause any friction with like childhood friends or, or anything like that of them having more means than you? And that was there ever any issues with that? No, not really. You know, I had some friends to be another in Destin. You know, they came from prominent families and had a lot of money, but you know, I don't. No one ever picked on me because I didn't have the new pair of Nike shoes, you know, yeah. first day of school or anything like that. Uh, yeah. It was a real small community. I mean, Destin's grown a ton since then, but back yeah. then everybody was pretty close and yeah, no real issues. Yeah, that's good. Uh, one story that you share in the book about uh, your your real dad giving you a jacket and this kid <laughs> fucking stealing it from you. Yeah. You never got it back? No, no, I never did, man. That was in, uh, you know, junior high back then. So we had, you know, seventh, eighth, and ninth was junior high. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he gave me that billabong jacket, and I was all pumped up. And uh, it's funny. I'll, so many of my high school friends now are reaching out to me, and they're like, who was it? You yeah. know, tell us who it was. Tell us who it was. And I'm like, man, uh, no, I'm going to keep that quiet for now. But I will say, in my defense, uh, it, was, it was a pretty tough dude. He was yeah. one of those that had uh, flunked a couple. So we were in seventh grade. He should have been in ninth grade. And yeah. he would, yeah, it was, uh, I say, if I want it back now, I better go pack my lunch if I'm going to go take it from him. Do you, I mean, do you know what he's doing or maybe kept in contact? Yeah, with him? the thing is, if I, t- I mean, we're friends on Facebook and we corresponded <laughs> about some stuff. And I bet you if he read it, he probably wouldn't even remember it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so I always say when I get back home, if I ever bump into him, I'm going to tell him. And, uh, yeah. Give him some shit about it. I would. I fuck. I'd bust his balls. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fuck face. <laughs> Remember me? Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. The uh, all right. So in high school, um, there was a an instance where you, you tried football, uh, even though it was kind of outside your comfort zone. But there was a coach that had a pretty big impact. At, at what point did did it kind of click to you? Um, where you decided, you know what, I, I want to join the military. I. I Kind of laugh at the at the seal aspirations, uh, not laugh. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to me, it's. I think it's great. To, I mean, I, I always like to see you know people that you know have a have a dream and aspire to be something and, and chase after it. I mean, un, unfortunately, I mean, it was just out of out of your control to to not be able to do it. But uh, but I, I guess kind of walk us through where you decided this is what I want to do and this is why I want to be a SEAL and and, and as you finish up high school and, and walk us into joining the military ultimately. Yeah. Well, the military, that decision didn't come till college. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I thought about it as a kid growing up in a military community. But no, the, the football deal was, you know, and I talk about in the book, I I played it safe. You know, like I said, I was a guy, I would go stand up for anybody else, but I never stood up for myself, i.e. the billabong jacket. And baseball came easy, uh, you know, academics came easy for me, so I, I stayed in my little comfort zone. Uh, I had a lot of friends, and I was good at baseball, and our football team was getting to be pretty good, and everybody's like, man, you should come out and play. You know, you're, you're really fast. You're one of the fastest guys out here. So finally, it was the uh, end of my junior year, so I went out for spring football and, you know, went out there and just hated it. And the, the coach you're t- talking about, Coach Steve Williams, who I just this past week just had triple bypass surgery and oh, wow. yeah I came out of it well but I went out there and you know he had heard you know heck the head coach was he was one of the main ones recruiting me to play uh, and Coach Williams didn't like having this baseball player thrown at his feet and say hey, do something with this kid and that guy was such an asshole to me I mean speaking of times being different now that I felt like man you would get arrested nowadays if you did yeah. to kids what <laughs> some yeah. of the stuff you would do to me. But, you know, he, he gave me all kind of hell all through spring and then summer. And then we had this camp that we went to at the end of summer uh, during our two days. And uh, I wanted to quit, but that's one of the things my mom said. You can start something, and you don't have to, but you will finish it. You yeah. don't have to go back out the next year, but you will never quit anything. Yeah. So it was that, but it was also, you know, I'm not going to give this prick the satisfaction of he ran me off, which I know is what he's trying to do. So yeah. at the end of that camp, he pulled me aside and said, hey, man, things are going to be different now. You've you've earned your keep you've proven yourself to me and I, and I think for me what it showed it was the first time I had done something really outside of my comfort zone and succeeded in it and yeah. in my the way it went through my head is I stood up for myself you know instead of standing up for somebody else like I've yeah. always done I stood up to this man this asshole coach and you know little did I know it would just become one of the biggest influences in my life yeah and so uh yeah our team was really good uh you know, heck, our, our quarterback was Danny Warfel, who ended up going to win the Heisman at Florida. And oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I grew up with him. And 
think we had like 18 of the 22 guys that started that state championship game all went on to play college ball wow. so finished up fifth in the country and you know, the whole usa today myth- mythical so yeah we were good wow so with that i got an opportunity some small schools were looking at me and uh you know, like hey come on you know we've only played one year so but come up here and uh you know if things work out we'll put you on scholarship so that's when i went up to samford to, to go play football up there and it was there when it was like this newfound all right you know i stood up to this challenge give me another one you know give me another one and i got up there and got redshirted was scout team tailback my first year and just got my ass whipped daily you know a five nine hundred and fifty pound white kid you yeah. know running around everywhere but you know again it was just that constant uh i can do this i can yeah. do this and so that's when the military thing really started really started kicking in so i guess one thing i in, in reading it i found myself being curious is that was there an instance that during that process that you said here's why i want to be a seal like wh- what was the the driving force for that specifically well what, you know it was was it Charlie Sheen? <laughs> you can be honest. <laughs> well, uh, Dick Marcinko, yeah. yeah, Road Warrior read that. You know, and, and some of it, the military, in going, it did kind of start in high school with Silence of the Lands, and someone said the best way is a law degree or the military. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons I picked Samford is they had a great law school, uh, and it was early on into Samford uh, that <clears> I realized that I wanted to go the military route. And during that time, yeah, I mean, I watched Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen, and, yeah. I, and I know you did too. I was oh, yeah. listening to some old ones. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I found the Rogue Warrior books and, and all that. And just part of it was the challenge, man. If you're going to do something, go go do the best. Yeah. And so the other things that I had mentioned beforehand uh, just gave me this belief in myself that I can do this. And beach, water, I spent my whole life in the water. Yeah. How, uh, how did that, again, I know it's in the book, but... Uh, what was the deal with the sol- shoulder surgery and, and ultimately you, you weren't able to to, uh, to go? Yeah, so I, I didn't do ROTC or anything like that. So I'm um, 22, you know, 10 foot and bulletproof, just a dumbass kid. And I'm like, I'm going to graduate college, go to the Navy recruiter's office, tell them I want to be a SEAL. And they're going to say, all right, here you go. So I did that. And he said, well, do you want to be an officer or do you want to enlist? And I said, well, I want to be an officer. I got a degree. And he said, well, uh, probably not going to get in you know this was pre 9-11 it's yeah. like they don't take many guys like Should you even post 9-11 you'd yeah. be hard pressed to get in yeah for an officer spot but. yeah yeah he's like you know but again uh, i can do this you know i'm me look at all these things that i've overcome and so that first year i graduated in may of 97 and i had missed the window to apply and they had a board and they told me in june is what they had said so i'm like all right you know i'll start planning for it next year and then i kind of hit that year of all right, do I want to do this? Do I want to, I basically just kind of took a year to figure out, you know, what do I want to do? And I've moved back up to Birmingham, party with my friends all the time. And then realized, no, I want to do this. I moved back to Florida the following May, uh, again, had missed the window to apply. So I'm like, all right, I'm going for the board next year and worked out all the damn time, swam, you know, built up a great, they got some great recommendation letters. I went to college with a, with a young lady whose dad was a U.S. Senator and had got to know him. And so, yeah, I put my packet in and waited by the phone every day, figuring I'm going to get the call soon. You know, this is, this is a 19, you know, summer of 99. And then he called one day and said, Hey man, I told you that they didn't pick you. And yeah. you know, there's something else you want to do in the Navy. You know, you got a strong packet. And I said, no, nope, no, nope, I'm going to try again next year. And so it was during that next year and my shoulder had been bothering me for, I'd separated it a couple of times playing ball. And so it was probably end of 99 early 2000 where it was just you know i couldn't do anything so i went to the doctor and he said all right let's go in and scope it try to clean it up a little bit and so we did that in april of 2000 and the the recruiter had told me again hey you're probably not going to get picked but you know they just scope it you're you're cool and so when he came back after the scope he said man it was much worse than i thought it was going to be in there and let's give it a few months but we probably need to go back in and do reconstructive surgery And so sure enough, it wasn't healing. And so in August, I went back in. They cut me open and, you know, detached my deltoid, shaved off the end of my clavicle and said, yeah, here's your 12, 14-month recovery. Yeah. And the Navy said, thanks, but no thanks. Enjoy the rest of your life. And so I was like, shit, what do I do now? And uh, so, yeah, that's when I, I left and moved out to here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
One thing on that, uh, I mean, did the, the, the thought or concept not cross your mind of saying, well, fuck it, let me go enlisted, do a, you know, an enlistment, get get to Buzz, <clears throat> you know, and then try to cross over and get picked up for uh, for a commission after that? Every person I talked to told me that's what I should do. But a lot of it is, some of it's young, piss and vinegar. Some of it's just ignorance. Yeah. And again, I didn't have any, you, know, you throw out these ranks. I mean, hell, the first time... To me, I, I enlisted to be an officer is what I thought. You know, I didn't understand the difference. Yeah. And as it went on, I think it just became a pride thing at that point. Yeah. Uh, but in hindsight, you know, where was Mike twenty years ago giving me this giving me this advice? I'm at, shit, I was right there. Yeah. I was right. There. I was just a couple of years uh, ahead of you at that point. But um, it, I, I couldn't help but laugh in the next chapter in your life, uh, <laughs> and that you go, you were a financial advisor of some sort, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to move to Dallas and uh, and start a job at fucking CarMax. Talk uh, talk us through that decision. So yeah, man, that happened. You know, so the, the financial job was just something to make a few bucks while I was, you know, trying to go into the Navy. And then when that didn't work out, I realized that the previous years being a financial advisor uh, taught me that people with money that were 40, 50 years old did not want the advice of a 25 year old financial advisor driving so, a Subaru. Yeah. So all, all I managed to do in being a financial advisor was get myself into crazy debt, yeah. just, uh, you know, living the life and taking people out to dinner and having no, so yeah, man, I maxed out all my credit cards. And so then, you know, the Navy dream fell apart and I figured with that, you know, the military was, uh, it was time for, you know, for option B yeah. and a friend of mine, uh, who I'd met in Florida had gone to work for CarMax, and I kind of said the same thing, like selling used cars, man, what the heck? And he's I like, I didn't even actually realize CarMax was, has been around that fucking. Yeah, long. yeah, yeah. It was but, pretty early on, and uh, you know, at the time, Circuit City owned them, and he said, "No, man, I have nothing to do with selling cars. I'm all in the inventory management job. So it's a great kind of management and training program. Come in, and they, they call it buyer and training." And that's what you do. You appraise all the cars. If you go to CarMax now, there's a buyer that comes out and looks at it. You travel around the country, go to different auctions. Then you bring the inventory in. You know, you manage the margin on it. So I'm like, all right, hey, it's it's more money than I'm making now, and it's an opportunity. It's a it's a career, something, not a job. So they had a couple of locations. And they said, you know, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth area, or up in the Baltimore that area, DC area. You didn't pick Baltimore? Uh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, my you know my dad had lived out here years before and always liked this area. Uh, so yeah, in January of two thousand and one, uh, loaded up a U-Haul and me and the girlfriend, eventual wife, eventual ex-wife, we uh, moved out here and started a new life. I am curious. All right, so from from the uh, trading a car in standpoint, we're going to yeah. get totally off the rails here <laughs> for a second. I mean, what the fuck are you looking for, like? What what's what are some things that, that you can uh, give the insider info on trading in a used car? Like, what's your best bet to get the most for it? Is there is there things other than keeping it clean or like what what are things that you're going to be like? Fuck no, I'm not taking that <laughs> or that's that's a huge ding or that's a red flag or whatever. Yeah, and who man, it's it's probably changed, but I think some of the the, the base stuff is probably the same. Is one if the car's been in a wreck or been painted. Uh, you, you don't need Carfax to tell you that. We're going to be able to find it. There's just certain keys, and I don't care how good the people are, you can find that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole myth of, you know, clean your car, make it immaculate before you go trade it in to get appraised, that didn't... Doesn't matter? It doesn't really matter. Yeah. You know, now, again, you know, if a car goes in, it's got dog hair all over the place, and there's certain things, if it's so filthy, but, you know, like, heck, you know, my wife drives a minivan, we got three kids in it, there's crumbs everywhere all the time, and that's, that's not something we would ding it for. Yeah. But yeah, there's any kind of frame damage. There's certain, and again, technology is probably so much better now. But people would come in and just lie their ass off, like, "Well, I just never been in a wreck." Blah blah blah. And I'm like, Dude, "Douchebag!" You know, I can tell right here. Let me show you this. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I kind forgot I got in the yeah, head on collision. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, there's nothing else that uh, sticks out. Or are you keeping the cards close? Uh, no, no. I mean, it's a pretty yeah. open thing. You know, I, I will say this, and I can't speak for other places, but at CarMax, so you know, you bring your car into me and. You know, again, we're offering wholesale money, uh, not retail. And, you know, like, all right, Mike, here's $10,000 for your truck. And if we turned around and sold that truck, uh, I would get basically dinged. It was a performance evaluation we were constantly under that if we sold it for 
eleven thousand dollars at an auction or twelve. If we made too much money on it, I got dinged because that means that I didn't give you a good enough deal on what your car was really worth. Oh, yeah, oh, that's nice. Yeah, and you get the black books that come out every week, and I mean the market uh, is it's like the stock market. I mean there is. I forget what was going on, but Ford Explorers were just impossible to come by. So the company flew me to Vegas, then to San Diego, and then up to L.A. and said, I got to L.A. And they're like, we don't care what it costs. Come back home with five Explorers. Really? Whatever. Yeah. So I'm up there. People are looking at me like, who's this freaking idiot, man? Who's this cartel guy looking <laughs> yeah, for yeah, Explorers? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just paying way above market value for it. But, you know, we needed the inventory on the lot. Yeah, that's fucking wild. Yeah. All right, so... That's January of 2001, 9-11 happens. Now all of a sudden, just like I, I would imagine post Pearl Harbor, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. fucking pissed off. I was on active duty already at a SEAL team, but was that kind of the, the defining moment from the sounds of it where it was like, I'm fucking, I'm going back in. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm getting back after it. Yeah, you know, and I, and I talk about in the book, it really started about a month before that. I was working at a different CarMax store. It's and the Black Hawk Downs. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. And there was a dude there, same thing. I wanted to go in the military, didn't work out. And he asked me if I'd read the book. So I started reading it, and it's kind of like, shit, man, I still I still want to do this. And went home, talked to the, uh, to the girlfriend, and said, man, you're going to kill me, but, you know, the Navy's probably not going to work out, but I just wanted to maybe Army, Marines, something. Just maybe explore it. I would have figured the car salesman and you would have said, <laughs> Babe, I've, I've got the greatest opportunity I'm going to share with you right now. And <laughs> get rid of that fucking bullshit. And if you give me 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, and she just looked at me and said, uh, she's like, you know, she grew up in an Air Force family. She said, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm for it, but we're finally paying off bills. We finally got, you know, let's just don't do anything rash. And you know, not to be over dramatic, but that was on a Tuesday night. We had that conversation, and the next Tuesday was September 11th. Yeah, Did, was she more supportive post 9/11? Yeah, like yeah. In terms, just over, over, or generally speaking. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was, yeah. and you know, we knew it was going to be tough, and you know, people forget. You know, the, to, you know, 2001. There was no talk of Iraq at the time, so we're yeah. like, man, you know, we were just blowing through Afghanistan, looking like we were going to being out of there in no time. So yeah. we didn't really know what the future held or what the op tempo was going to be like for the, the next decade plus. Yeah. But at the time, every, every, everybody was on board. Yeah. In, in reading through the kind of trials and tribulations that you and her experienced throughout your early military career, it's, it's understandable uh, for those of you who uh, aren't service members, et cetera. It, it paints a, a pretty vivid picture on, on just how tough it is on relationships and why the divorce rate is so high in the military, et cetera. But uh, if you could give us the kind of the chrono uh, timeline between when you joined and ultimately until you uh, get get pulled overseas and we'll get into the, the meat and potatoes okay. of, of the book, but uh, especially with the, the Ranger or the rap experience, I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit yeah. about that also, but just walk us through quickly joining in, joining and, and getting to where, where you were getting ready to deploy. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, 9-11 happened in the recruiter's office two days later. Uh, talked to the Army and Marines, ultimately found out pretty quick. The Army was the only one that I could get infantry guaranteed. And I said, all right, you know, I want to do the Special Forces Ranger stuff, but at least I know I can get infantry. So ironically, and I think I talk about in the book, the Army medically cleared my shoulder with no problem. Uh, the Navy had cleared me. I'm allergic to all seafood, fish and shellfish. Really? Yeah. Growing up in Destin, Florida, world's luckiest seafood fishing <laughs> village. And the Navy had no problem with it. So then the Army, when I'm at MEPS, they cleared my shoulder and then medically disqualify me for the seafood. I'm like, what the, what the hell, man? So, yeah, I had a you know, waiver process. So I bring that up. Just there was a delay. So I didn't ship off for basic training until October of 2002. Yeah. Uh, so it took about a year to get all that done. So, yeah, basic training. Came home before officer candidate school. We got married, a uh, quick little ceremony. Off to officer candidate school, did that, got out, went to airborne school. Uh, airborne school was May of 2003. I got my commission in April of 2003. Do you know about what the percentage is of infantrymen that go through airborne? Uh, pretty much there. It was, you know, you got out of... I did it before. Sometimes it's timing, but if you're infantry, they send you to airborne school. Like everybody? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Uh, one uh, one thing I didn't realize, uh, the boot camp that you went through was with enlisted guys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and I went through, man, it was co-ed. Because, again, at the time, 
I, I'm not technically assigned my my MOS yet, or, you know, mm-hmm. what I'm going to be as an officer. Even though I had it in my contract, I was getting infantry, and I had a letter from infantry branch guaranteeing me that the way the army works, basic training. So it was co-ed basic training at Fort Jackson. Uh, there was one person there that was going into the infantry and it was me. And so, yeah, that was an experience, you know, 28 years old. And now I'm in this co-ed platoon in Fort Jackson. Seems like an odd place to send you. I mean, the army yeah. doesn't have to make sense. Right? Yeah. It's the army, man. Let's not be yeah. here all day, beating our head against the wall. Yeah. All right. So you go through OCS. Um, I am curious, did, how how much did uh, did that change or impact your mentality as it relates to, you know, kind of buffering in that officer mentality if there was any of that? OCS was, uh, sorry if any of my cadre are listening to this, was the dumbest fourteen weeks of my life. Yeah, it really was. It's a, it's a mix of you know enlisted green to gold. Uh, it's the other half for guys like me, or gals like me. It, it's co-ed, and how do you how do you send somebody through a 14 week school and teach them to be a leader? You know, and they, they use infantry tactics to kind of put you in stressful situations, but the majority of it is, you know, all right, wake up, you got 10 minutes to shut, shower, shave and get out for first formation. And they made you memorize all these dumb quotes and the cadre could stop you. And if you couldn't, you know, say the quote or the drop of a dime. So it was all these things to put you in stressful situations, but really have nothing to do with making you a leader of men or women at yeah. that time. For me, I was incredibly fortunate. Uh, my roommate was a prior service. Uh, he'd been in, in Ranger Battalion. And then the guys in the room next to us, one of them, he was an E8 going through and the guy was just squaring the hell away. How yeah. old was he? Yeah, he was young, man. He was one of those guys like eight and eight ideal. Yeah. And uh, he's still active duty now. He's a Lieutenant Colonel now. Wow. And then the other guy, who uh, you probably read about was a big influence. He was a prior service SF guy, Yeah, uh, Matt Musso, and just a funny, funny son of a bitch. But between those three, I mean, that, those, you're kind of immediate circle. You know, you're sharing a sharing a shitter. And those were the guys that were, Jeff, don't pay any attention to any of this crap that's going on. This is how it really works. And the fact that I was older going through, I think some people naturally thought I was prior service and found that was, I mean, to me, it was just life maturity, not being some... You know, 22 year old Jeff would not be ready to go yeah. lead men in that scenario. But yeah, those guys were uh, very influential in my career. I mean, it sounds like you learned more from them than you did oh, the, the yeah. officer. Yeah, 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 hands yeah. down. Yeah. All right, so you finish that. Um, you go to your unit and you get an opportunity to go through uh, the Ranger indoctrination course, right? No, no, there is an infantry officer. So I did airborne right after OCS just because of timing. We had a little gap before the next infantry officer basic course. And pretty much everybody that goes through IOBC, they call it something different now. Uh, but you go to Ranger school after that, you at least get an opportunity to do it. And so uh, IOBC was June through September and uh that was 16 weeks and uh, that was that was a moose the guy you know the sf guy is what we called him he was in my platoon there and uh, my friend adam that we talk about in the book who ultimately passed uh you know just two dudes squared away <clears throat> learned a ton from those guys and then got out and then uh my ranger school date was that october and i know so we didn't do like the you know the rip thing that other guys it's you ship off all you know you ship off to uh just straight to ranger school yeah. and then it was in rap week of course where i had the uh you know i i tell her i wish i had some cool story i could tell of something cool in ranger school no it was a land nav course yeah. you know walking to my first point and you know pitch dark and just step on a log or something whatever and felt the knee kind of tweak and you know limp through it but got to a point where i just couldn't walk anymore i mean i could walk but i, I couldn't pass the course and so yeah. i ended up failing you get an opportunity to retake it uh you know, the RIs out there, they were, they could be hard asses, but they were actually pretty cool. I think they saw that I was at least trying. I wasn't trying to, you know, it was all, are you hurt or are you injured? And yeah. uh, I think in my mind, I knew I was injured, but I wanted to act like I was hurt. So I made it through everything else that week, except the, the road march. We get an opportunity to retake the land nav course the day before the road march at the end of rap week. And I just, just couldn't do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm not considering a lie. Land nav, make your insert officer joke here. Land nav was never my strong point. <laughs> yeah, sure. But uh, but yeah, so it was actually one of the instructors saw me gimping around pretty bad. You're not supposed to talk out there. And he was the one that came up to me and just sort of said, you know, man, things aren't looking good for you. And uh, if I were you, 
if you make it through this and then you kind of get stuck out here, but if you fail, you get to go back to the IOBC headquarters. You'll probably have a better chance to, you know, get healed up quickly and you can come back. And they always give you a shot to come back. So that was the plan. But what happened was if you were going to a unit that had deployment orders in the next 12 months, you didn't get a second shot to go back. Oh, okay. And so I didn't know that at the time. So I thought, oh, I'll come back, get my knee healed up. I had surgery in January of 2004. And that's when I was told that, no, no, uh, no redo for you, buddy. Heal up and then you're, you're off to Fort Hood. Does it still bother you that you didn't get to go back there? Is it something yeah. you still think about? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, you got a story or a tab. You never want to be the story guy. Yeah. And, uh, I am a lifelong story guy and it pisses me off to no end. Yeah. All right. So you don't get to go back there. You end up going to Fort Hood, uh, right after the unit you're with has actually already deployed. Um, I guess I'm curious, for, you know, like from a logistics standpoint, why, um, what was the delay on that or why did you get there after they deployed? Just the way I had to get medically cleared, you know, so I had surgery mm. in January and I guess it was March when, you know, went back for the eight week checkup, whatever it was, and they blessed off on my knee. So yeah, it was into March, got out to, uh, I shipped off the hood and then a couple of weeks of in processing and then just waiting on a deployment date. So I went over there, I think it was the second week of May, 2004. Yeah. And, uh, tell us about that experience of, uh, hitting the ground and, and integrating with the guys. Yeah, man, you, you get over there and, you know, pick you up, driving a deuce and a half over to, uh, we went to the international zone. I was going to third brigade, uh, with first cav. And then it's like, all right, what are we going to do with you? So like, all right, you, you're going to this battalion, you, you're going to that battalion. They pointed at me and this other guy and said, you two guys are going to one nine and they're right up the road. Uh, so moved up the road, uh, Almathana airfield and it was Fob headhunter at the time. They changed the name, but it was in the, the Haifa street area, just North of the international zone. Then you get there and it's like, they don't have a platoon waiting for you. So I went to the S2 shop and worked the night shift, just compiling intelligence reports. Uh, I made the mistake, someone told me this, they're like, in the military, never let anybody know if you can type fast. Yeah. <laughs> and my dumb ass did. So that's what I did all night. But then during the day, I would go out with the platoons and, and shadow the platoon leader. And they said, yeah, it looks like we got a couple of guys, their time's coming up here in a few months. So. Uh, you know, just spend time with these two guys and get to know the men. So I, I did. And then that summer, uh, the battalion commander called me in. And uh, so that was Charlie one nine was the company up there. And Alpha one nine had been detached to, uh, to an Arkansas National Guard unit down in the international zone. And they were like, well, we thought we were going to keep you here, but we're actually going to send you down to Alpha Company. And I was pissed, man, because you know, all the action was up there on Haifa Street. Everybody knew Alpha Company was in this real slow area. Nothing was going down. Uh, but that's what happened. So, yeah, in July of 2004, I went down and took over a platoon there in Alpha Company. Were, you mentioned going out during the day. Were, were uh, those units not doing any nighttime stuff? Yeah, yeah. We went out some at night. But, again, usually my, my job was at <clears throat> night, so I didn't get to go out. But, yeah, the majority of the stuff we did, I would say, was at night. Yeah, okay. Uh, but then a lot of the day stuff was more, you know, the – go kick down a door was at night to go out patrol the area and try to gain some intel. All that yeah. stuff was during the day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the chapters that kind of get into the specifics of the operations and stuff, I purposefully didn't read so that my interview uh, of you is a little less, you know, forthcoming or, you know, bias or whatever. But, um, from, so from when you went to, uh, with that other unit mm -hmm. that was in a slower area, did it start to pick up or how, how did that go? Yeah, so I took over an Alpha platoon early July and spent a month patrolling down around Baghdad University. And again, nothing happened. And we rode around in our Bradleys. We had no action to speak of whatsoever. And then things were getting worse. We would hear all the reports about how bad Hypa Street was getting. And word on the street was, you know, you had the big Fallujah and Sadr City uprisings in April 2004. And then in particular, a lot of the Al-Qaeda guys were leaving Fallujah and coming and setting up shop, you know, in and around Haifa Street. And I'm sure we'll get to the Hamity stuff later, but it makes a lot of sense with what was going on at the MOD at the time. Yeah. But yeah, so it was just getting worse and worse. So they, 
they made the call. They're like, hey, we're going to have Alpha Company. You guys are going to go up and help Charlie Company on this big mission one day. And that was our first chance to get in the action. And uh, so we did that early August. And then they made the decision, hey, you guys are going to, they need help up there. You guys are going to be, you know, we're going to reattach you back to your parent unit and you're going to be up on Haifa Street full time. Before you went and did that, when you first integrated to uh, the new group of guys, what what type of like peacock feather and pissing contest was there in terms of them accepting you as as their leader, so to speak? I mean, was there any of that, or were they just like, yeah, come on board, we'll fucking follow you into anywhere? Like, how much did yeah. you have to prove yourself, and how did you? No, I mean, they were, uh, again, I think it helped that I was older. The majority of the guys assumed that I was prior service. Yeah. Uh, so I think that just naturally helped. And but that, I mean, was that not uh, discussed at all? Like, yeah, no, I told they asked. I told them. I think yeah. it was just more sometimes that first impression yeah. bit, uh, I think, hel- I think it helped me that, you know, in their eyes, I had just spent the last month, you know, patrolling Haifa Street, you know, the dangerous place with these other guys, even though I wasn't in charge. At least I'd been up there and seen some stuff. Yeah. Whereas these guys hadn't seen anything. And they were great, man. They were professionals. I mean, yeah, there's a, a few tests here and there, uh, but it was... Uh, and again, some of from the lessons I learned from those guys, I didn't come in. Hey, there's a new sheriff in town. Hey, I just spent a month on Hypa Street. I'm like, guys, man, I'm here. Teach me because if the shit hits the fan where we're at, you know, you the one, you guys got all the experience. I don't. So, yeah. kind of show me the way. I also just understand that I have some ideas as well, and you know, together we can make something good happen. When you were that month that you did spend up on Haifa Street, did you guys get into any uh, any contacts that uh, that were notable? Not any of the ones that I was on. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I never hid that. I'm like, yeah, guys, there's shit going on on Haifa Street all the time. I hadn't seen anything. You know, we had a few times a couple of pop shots that where they directed at us, or not. It's, it's hard to tell. Uh, but no, I, at that point, I had not seen yeah. any combat. And so you guys go, you get embedded with them. They decide to, to pop you back up to Haifa Street. At that point, did things start to, to get pretty fucking crazy? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was like second week of August. Uh, I think it was August twelfth, and you know, it's uh, you, you talk about the marriage stuff, and, and things were. It was all fun and games until I was gone for two and a half of the first three years of our marriage. And so it was that early August where I called home one day, and she just said, "I can't do this anymore." And then, you know, damn, and. A couple hours later, we went out, and that was the first, you know, that was my combat cherry was popped. We were rolling up Haifa Street, going north, and, you know, it was back to the Black Hawk Down reference, man. It was tires in the road, on fire, black smoke. You know, we realized, hey, they're trying to get us to turn left. Hell, there's nowhere else to go. We have to turn left. And again, man, we left, you know, back then, coming from a slow area, we rode around our Bradleys. You know, we didn't have the hatch down, and we like we called it dick defilade. You know, we all stood up and uh, just like a bunch of idiots, and uh, it was like slow motion, man. You know, we turned left, and I was the second Bradley in the formation, and uh, as soon as we start to turn left, just saw a you know two man team come out from one side, another two man team. This group had an RPG, the other guy's machine gun, and just unloaded the RPG, went in between my Bradley and my platoon sergeant's Bradley behind me didn't hit anything the rounds they were shooting more at the at his brad bradley than mine and we could hear them and uh you know no i mean shit, it happened so fast i mean no one returned fire you know we just like holy shit and they were gone and then after they were gone then you know one guy turned around and actually shot but it was like this you know it, it seemed like an eternity but it was probably a seven ten second interaction and uh yeah, so we came back and... Did any of your guys get wounded in that one? No, no, not in that one. No, so, you know, we, we learn pretty quick. Well, you know, next time, don't turn left. Let's, you know, don't do what they want us to do. And uh, next time, somebody fucking return fire. Yeah. And, you know, we all admit it. We were all it, scary as shit the first time. You, know, you think about someone shooting something trying to kill you. For sure it is. And uh, the reality of it really set in. And, I, and I've never hid that fact that I was scared shitless. Yeah. I think anybody that says that uh, they're not is either lying or they're so desensitized to where it's it's fucking dangerous. You yeah. Know, for yeah, sure. But, yeah. But after that, man, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty steady. It was uh, probably about a week after that. We were out. We would do these things called thunder runs. We would just... You know, just to try to, you know, show a force, whatever you want to call it. We would just 
get on the bottom, come out of the international zone and just haul up S, you know, haul up uh, Hyphen Street and then turn around and come back. We would stop, occupy to little square right there in the middle and kind of like, all right, you know, you want some, come out and get some. But of course they wouldn't. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, the first big firefight were return fire, first kills we got uh, were that instance where we went in to rescue the Iraqi National Guard. Can you uh, talk us through that that whole gig? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, so so we were the QRF force kind of on standby. And one of the QRF things can be just go do, go do a thunder run. So we were actually prepping to go do another thunder run when we got wind that uh, an Iraqi army, Iraqi National Guard unit was pinned down and getting their ass handed to them right there off to Little Square off Haifa Street. And so it was eerie, man. We're, we're driving up and again, back to something you see in a movie and, you know, we hear about this big gunfight going on, but we don't see anything, but we hear it and we can tell it's kind of off, you know, behind out the slum area. And as we're driving up, we see this, this body, uh, Iraqi soldier, and it's just streamed up between two light poles right there in Toledo Square and uh, been decapitated. And I'm like, shit, man, this is, you know, where are they at? So we're waiting for the ambush. And then sure enough, then kind of in the, I guess it would be the Southwest corner. There was this thing we call the salt factory and they stacked salt up out front. And that was a great place for them. And the alleyway behind it, we had nicknamed it Grenade Alley. So you had Grenade Alley and Purple Heart Lane. And uh, so, yeah, we were rolling up through there and, you know, this two man team popped up behind some of the salt bags and started, I don't know why they shoot at Bradley driving by. They were actually probably shooting at my dumb ass at Dick Defilade standing up. (laughs) So yeah, so we turned fire there, and uh, and then we turned around, and we turned around a building kind of adjacent to it, the other side of a corner. Someone started dropping grenades at us. And at that point, you know, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I quickly realized I should probably shut my hatch and, and get down. So shut my hatch and got in there, and my gunner got you know wind of where he was at up there, and just kind of waited. Once we saw the guy go to peek over again, the gunner shot up at the top of the building and killed that guy. So at, at this point, this is daytime, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and how big is the group that you're in? Mm. So it was just my platoon at that point. Uh, four Bradleys and, you know, the Bradley crews and the dismounts in the back, like 34 total. 34 total. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many of them were fucking with you? No. I mean, none, no. none whatsoever. And we kept hearing, we're trying to get reports of where are these Iraqi guys? And as we kind of split out, and, and Tilla Square is this big, huge intersection of two major highways. And... Then we could see the Iraqi trucks down kind of closer to the river, and that's where we could tell the sound was coming from. So I uh, gave the order, drop my dismounts, and they worked their way and kind of fought their way down to where the last group of Iraqis, and there was a bunch of, unfortunately, a bunch of the dead Iraqi army guys were down there. So my guys kind of fought their way in, set up security and perimeter around then. We brought some Bradleys over, identified some positions where some of the insurgents were, and. Uh, once we rolled up in there, they never returned fire at us. They just hauled ass. And, Except uh, the one guy that you guys neutralized fairly quick. Yeah, that was early on. I'm saying after that. And yeah. Once we realized where the Iraqis soldiers were, we had to rescue. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of fighting after that. Do you know about how many Iraqis were killed that were strewn about? I didn't know at the time and just because we were just basically pulling security. And then once we secured the area, some other Iraqi vehicles came and picked them up. But I didn't know until you know, Hamity was on here, that it was 20. It yeah. was a total number that there was a, of the 29 that went out that day, 20. Uh, and that counts the guy, uh, that was, uh, decapitated and hanging by the string. Yeah. What impact did that have on you and your guys seeing all of that at that point? I mean, cause it sounds like that was kind of the first real exposure to, I guess, for lack of better terms, atrocity of, you know, seeing a bunch of dead guys and, and knowing like, fuck that, that could be us. Yeah, you know, it was twofold. I mean, one of it was the thrill of, you know, the first time we saw combat, we all froze. And so here we get another shot at it. And, uh, you know, I, I think we did it right that day. Yeah. You know, we we saved some guys. You know, we got there too late <clears throat> to save more. Uh, killed a couple of bad guys along the way. So, I mean, the instant was the rush of it that I talked about earlier. Yeah. And then... I don't think anybody talked about it, but I know I thought about it. And as time went on, we all kind of went back to that day of <clears throat> like, shit, man, you know, if we're ever get caught alone, that's going to be us yeah. hanging from that wire across the street that day. So it was, it was an excitement. Uh, it was a sense of pride that we did something good that day, but it was also, uh, sobering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. 
All right, so you guys go back to the to the compound, so to speak. Um, the these thunder runs, and if you could kind of get, give us the general gist of what you were doing there, was it mostly just patrolling, looking for fucking trouble, or or what what was kind of your your mission set? So you'd have, <clears throat> you know, we would go out in the morning. Alpha Company would go out and. All right, we're going to go just patrol and walk these streets, these alleyways, kind of a show of force. And some of it was, it was almost baiting. Like, yeah, you know, if we come out and, and the big, the big tactic at the time was they would just, the insurgents would pay the local populace, you know, and, you know, Hypha Street, you look at it, it's really nice, nice buildings, looks great behind it, just straight shanty towns. I mean, raw sewage, <clears> running, <throat> just a maze of, of mud huts. And so that's where all the, the shit really went down. And they would just throw grenades at us constantly. And so that's when we started seeing some injuries from grenade shrapnel. Uh, so, but like Alpha Company would go out and then two hours later, they would send my platoon out on a thunder run. And you're talking 15, 20 minutes up, down, just to try to show constant presence. You know, then Charlie Company may go out later. Uh, and then some were targeted operations at night. Some were just show of force during the day. And what we started to see is that we would go out and do these missions and, you know, the, the base had the big J lens camera up. And then after we would leave, you would see all the insurgents come out, you know, toting their AKs and their RPGs like, oh, look at us. We ran off the mighty Americans. And so it was probably early September. Uh, some guys came up and that's when we started seeing the, the special ops guys coming in uh, just because there was so much going on on Hyper Street. And so they brought in this group of SEALs and it was, all right, hey, let's go occupy this building and act like we're clearing everything and send 100 guys out and then 90 leave and leave four SEAL snipers and a six-man squad or something back to protect them. And the first time we did it, man, it was flawless. We drove off. They started coming out dancing around like, oh, look at us. And then it was just, you know, I wasn't on that one, but we were all watching on the J lens. And these guys were just, uh, hell, you probably know some of them, and just picking guys off left and right. Yeah. So we did that a couple of times. I'm like, hey, it's the Army. This works. Let's do it every time. Yeah, so let's it do it until it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Let's fix it until yeah. it's broken. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll probably get to it next. But, uh, yeah, it, it, we overstayed that tactic and uh, kind of came back to bite us in the ass on September 12th, and that was – Biggest firefighter of the year. Yeah, it, uh, by all means, dig dig right into that one. Yeah, so this was a bigger group, uh, they, and it was going to be a forty eight hour mission. So they had these we call them the hotel series, but they were nine seventeen story buildings, uh, kind of on the southeast side of Hypo Street or southeast of Toledo Square. And we went in them some, but we had generally stayed away from clearing those rooms. And so we left at like three in the morning, and it was Alpha Company, you know, me and the my platoon and two other platoons and we went in with the seals and we freaking hauled it. and they had a they had a squad from the scout platoon uh, from battalion uh, so nine guys so i want to say it was nine seals and nine uh nine scouts and of course we had to carry food and water for them so me and all my guys we had to go and lug this you know <laughs> 17 flights of stairs a bunch of water and uh you know all that gear and then throw on a rucksack full of water and that shit's heavy <clears throat> But what really stuck out is nothing went down. You know, we went up, got the guys set up, and I guess they had their engagement criteria. It had to be a party of five or more uh, for them to open fire. And there, I don't know what floor they were on, but up pretty high in those hotel buildings. But what really struck us is when we left, and by the time we left, it was about five, and it was still dark outside. And they rarely ever attacked us at night because they had no, you know, no night vision capabilities. And we were pulling out through Toledo Square, and like two or three RPGs got shot at us. And then a bunch of dudes opened up and we were kind of like, oh shit, man, this, this doesn't happen at night, not around here, what's going on? So we went back to the base and as we pulled in, they said, don't even come up to the base, stay at the gate, uh, something's going down out there. <clears throat> and so the guys and I, one of the guys has a video of it. And again, man, it's like something you see in a movie. As it turns out, Al Qaeda was just gonna film a propaganda video that day. and. You know, their tactic, I told you, was they would pay the populace to harass us with grenades. And then every two, three, four weeks, whatever it may be, they would set up a coordinated ambush against us. And those were the true Al-Qaeda guys that knew what they were doing. And so some guys filming it, man. And you see these guys start coming out of this mosque and they just, 
line all both sides of the street and this dude's got an rpg this guy's got an ak and they just go and kind of just start marching up and down and you know, the guys videoing it and like man you know you said the engagement criteria was five we got 50 out here you know what do you want us to do and they were like well if you see them get kind of consolidated open fire and so they did and uh it didn't take long for all that stuff everybody to realize where the shots were coming from and you know, then just everybody and their brother came out, anybody with an AK. Uh, so they told us, you're like, haul ass in. And so we come rolling back up Hypha Street and third platoon occupied Tilly Square. My platoon had been the one that parked in front of the hotel series and dropped the seals off and carried all this, the stuff up. And then first platoon was behind us, occupying the intersection behind us. So we took the same thing going in and as we're rolling up and, uh, it was wild, man. Like third platoon hits a little square and it was like a damn like 4th of July, man. Just shit, just going everywhere. Like, wow. And, uh, you know, we had seen some stuff, but nothing like that. And then, so my guys, we pull up, drop my dismounts off cause the order had been to bring the seals and scouts down. We were going to get them back in our vehicles. <clears throat> but when we pulled up, they went after third platoon first and then people started taking pop shots at us. And, uh, and dismounts were on the ground and I'm usually the way to get out of a Bradley. I don't know if you ever spent much time in a Bradley. Almost uh, zero, but <laughs> I've n never operated. In yeah, one. you're a lucky man. So, you know, up in the, uh, in the turret, you got the gunner and the, the Bradley commander and, you know, I'm sitting on the right and the technical way to get out is you have this little, you know, door behind you that you swing open and then I crawl through it and then I go out the back with the rest of the dismounts. <clears throat> but to do that, once you open that door, the, the gunner can't, you know, he can't traverse any. So what everybody does is you flip the hatch off and you just jump out. And, you know, so that's what I'm going to do that day. So all my dismounts are on the ground and uh, flip the hatch up and I jump up and this dude at the corner just turns around and it's like he was just waiting for me and shot an RPG. And it was nowhere close to me. I'm not going to tell some macho guy shit. You know, he just slung it, but it was still the idea of, <clears throat> damn you know and so I dropped back down real quick and it's in the book my gunner uh, Sergeant Grant just grumpy old fart and uh, just as calm as he could be in all this chaos just looked at me and said sir that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> so it, we can, it makes me picture uh, Sam Elliott in the uh, we were soldiers once <clears throat> like that crusty old yep, fucking master that, that's exactly what he sounded like yeah so yeah, so I told the dismounts, I'm like, guys, you guys, uh, you know, you know, put the, the, the NCO, the head guy, Sergeant Jacobson, kind of told him to take over him to get link up with the SEALs and the scouts. And, you know, I would get over there when I could. So things kind of settled down for a little bit. And so I made another, uh, I swear, man, it's the fastest. I thought I ran fast on the football field, man. I've never been out the top, bounded off the Bradley and running. And I had to go about a hundred <clears> meters <throat> and got up in there with the men and, uh, linked up with the scouts and the SEALs and, those guys were great, man. They were just like, hey, where do you want us? You know, you, you, you know, we're down here now. We, you know, you got your guys. You guys are running all the comms. Tell us where you need us, and we're there. You know, so sent a couple of guys. You know, different floors, second, third floor, and again, things had kind of slowed down at that point. And then just out of nowhere, the building next to us was a smaller, I think, five-story building, uh, and behind that was all the shanty town, and so. We started getting a lot of grenades thrown over that way and they weren't quite getting to us, but they were getting closer. And just from a reference, so when we say we're in the breezeway, so this is the first floor of this essentially condominium. And you probably have, think of it if you're in a strip mall, you kind of got that 10, 12 foot overhang you know, mm -hmm. on the bottom floor. That's kind of what the breezeway is. And it was U-shaped going around, you know, so we had security and we had seals on the first and second floor. And then we started getting pop shots from across the street. Uh, and again, nothing was close, but you could tell people were moving in the shanty towns area and getting closer and closer to us. And so the building right next to us, the first, the grenades were coming from behind it. And then we started getting, and at this point, you know, they had the high ground and, uh, and again, we only had the, the seals were more at that point. We had focused them across. So we were kind of exposed on our flank and, uh, so at that point, saw where a couple of these guys were and just called one of the Bradleys up and just said, you just fucking level that thing. So he just went out and went black on ammo, just basically kind of zigzagging through all the all the windows over there and they quit firing. And then we still had the harassing uh, grenade guy behind the thing. So 
told some of my guys, I'm like, all right, we're free now. We can get on the open a little bit. And who's got a good arm? Who thinks they can get their grenade back and get this fucker? And a couple of guys tried. None of them were far enough. And then uh, I was just like, man, someone, you know, just you're fine. Step out in the open. You don't have to try to sling it sideways. You being the baseball guy, did the, yeah, yeah. Did the thought cross your mind? Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, I, I did. I, I did throw one. And I did not make it. Yeah. So I went back. I'm like, you know what? My job, command and control guy, <laughs> command and control guy. So this guy came up and he's like, Does anybody have a grenade? And I said, I got one left. And uh, so at this point, I'm kind of facing Hyper Street, you know, the buildings across from us. And this is on our flank. And uh, <clears throat> I gave this guy, I said, yeah, I got one grenade left. So I gave it to one of the scouts. And he's like, I'm going to get these fuckers. And the dude just freaking wound up, you know, did his crow hop like they teach in baseball and chucked the hell out of that thing. But he never stepped out from under the breezeway. No, oh, So he threw it and it hit the lip on the inside and started bouncing back towards us. And I had looked over and saw the whole thing going down. Again, most everybody's facing out. And this grenade is rolling up behind some of the guys. And, uh, you know, and it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, just quick assessment of I can get there, pull them on this side of, uh, you know, this small wall that was there. So I went up and grabbed two of my men and just, you know, grabbed them by the back of their vests and yanked them behind. And we got a turn the grenade luckily rolled the way. I want to tell you that I thought it would roll really yeah. <laughs> as it turned out. Grenade rolled just on the other side and, and detonated and detonated in a spot where uh, it still hit a couple of guys not the guys I had pulled, but some of the guys a little bit further away. So it was pretty minor, except for one guy. We thought it was minor. It didn't look like he was hit bad at all, but it got up in his bloodstream. He ended up getting lodged in his heart, a piece of shrapnel. God and damn. He made it. He yeah. made it, but he started coding, you know, right when we got him to the hospital. Holy fuck. Yeah, it was one of the scouts. Uh, two of my guys were injured. And uh, so all this shit storm's going on. And so I'm kind of standing up, figuring out, you know, kind of communicating casualties, dealing with all that. And then just loudest freaking explosion I'd ever seen at that point. And, uh, and what had happened is a car bomb had got through our rear security. And, uh, in time, we can give the guys a lot of shit now. We're like, you know, there's no cars on the road. There's nothing going on. Did it not strike you as odd that this car comes hauling ass at you? And when you yell at it to stop, it does it and hops on the curve. So got through first platoon and went up in our... Uh, it was our XO's vehicle. Our commander was actually on a, on leave at the time. So the XO was out there, and it was his Bradley, and the car bomb slammed into the Bradley, and it was probably about 100 meters from where I was at and just blew us all you know, in the walls. And there was a little small railing there and blew me into that and uh, messed my back up a little bit. So then I had to deal with the chaos of what was going on with that. The Bradley's on fire. and you were, know, were there people in the Bradley? There was a couple of people in the Bradley, yeah. And uh, the, the crew... And then the driver got out, and then uh, this was a little bit closer. First platoon's dismounts were a little bit closer to this. All my guys were in that one area, and so some guys from first platoon ran out and jumped on the burning Bradley and uh, got everybody out of there. And two guys got uh, two guys got silver stars for that wow. that day. Yeah, so we had so that was the day I got the bronze star with the, and then uh, so they put me in for a silver star, and it got downgraded. And then those guys were put in for Distinguished Service Cross, but they were downgraded to Silver Stars. Wow. Did uh, anybody in the Bradleys die? Or were no, they, they no, were all safe? No, yeah, yeah, all safe, yeah. yeah. How did you guys end up, I mean, how, how did that whole fucking scenario, wrap, well, two things, how did it wrap up? But I guess before you answer that, there's, you know, 50-plus dudes at this point. I mean, it, it, do you, were you pretty confident that you had neutralized a lot of them, some of them, a few of them? You know, did we neutralize them? I mean, some we felt pretty confident because they were in the building right next to us and nobody was shooting anymore. And there were still some pop shots here and there, uh, but were they neutralized or did they just run? And I think it's probably a mix of both. And so we carried, uh, you know, I had a couple of injured and we all kind of had to load up the plan that, you know, to get all these dudes and the Bradleys now a couple of injured guys. Uh, to get them down to the cache, which wasn't that far, uh, the hospital there in the international zone. So uh, got our guys. We kind of headed out first. The other two platoons stayed to kind of get us through since we had the injured. And then once we passed through them, then they exfilled and went back. Uh, I, I sh they waited before they exfilled because then you had to wait for uh, Charlie Company to stand up to come take over because the Bradley was on fire. 
And then once, then and I'm, I'm hearing bits of this over the radio, so some of it may be a little inaccurate, that uh, they were telling our guys to leave, but my, the other two platoons, but not Charlie Company come in yet uh, because that burning Bradley, uh, a huge crowd had formed around it. And, you know, there's guys out there, again, AKs, they got the Tawid and Jihad, the Al-Qaeda and Iraq flag, they're putting the barrel. I mean, you can Google it on, you know, Yahoo. Everyone always laughed, like, that was like the front page on Yahoo News and Fox News that day. It was a picture of that burning Bradley with the Al-Qaeda and Iraq flag. And so the call was made uh, because we had some sensitive equipment in their encryption devices. Uh, so they brought in some some birds, and they came in and shot a couple of hellfires into the Bradley. And did, did they were you guys not cleared out to engage the fuckers that were surrounding it? We were gone, and at the, this is when like there was a small crowd. Then that's when they told the other two platoons to leave. That's when the huge crowd came out. Yeah. And at that point, I guess, and again, I wasn't a part of those, they had made the decision that we're going to destroy this vehicle and we don't want any of the Americans around. So yeah, so man, they shot a bunch of hellfires into it. I think eight total. Again, I didn't see it go down. Uh, Did they get any of the crowd? Did they do it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was the, uh, again, Google September 12th, 2004, Hypha Street. And uh, the Al Jazeera reporter was reporting live from there and he was killed. Oh shit. Live, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think I gotta write this down. Yeah, there's a bunch of articles about uh, just some of the shit. I mean, a lot of stuff went down on Haifa Street, but that day in particular. But, and I think I mentioned in one of the emails to you of, you know, Sebastian Younger, and you know, yeah. people can think what they want, but he did a documentary last year, maybe two years ago, about uh, kind of the beginnings of ISIS, and uh, he traces back to, and he's very specific about, specific about it in the documentary. It says that was the day ISIS was born because, you know, in, in, in their eyes, how it spun it was all these innocent people out just protesting and the Americans come in and this kind of offshoot of Al-Qaeda that wanted to be under Zarqawi, that wanted to be, you know, more tougher and worse than, you know, traditional Al-Qaeda, that they used that as leverage that, all right, this is why we have to be so much more grotesque in the way we do things. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if it was the beginning of ISIS or not, but some people out there think it was. Yeah. So you guys uh, pull chocks, go back from there, they blow that up. What uh, what was it like after that? You know, the next is, you know, you go out one time and go do a patrol, nothing happens. The next time, just probably 50-50. And again, it was mainly grenades. Uh, you know, and we tried to, you know, we learned, we adapted pretty quick of, you know, before you're taught, you know, economy of force and do all these things. And we'd go down an alley with, you know, nine guys in a squad. And then meanwhile, the alleys adjacent to us, you know, they're chucking grenades over. And so uh, we had to improvise our tactics. And but that's where I started seeing uh, more and more injuries. You know, we got our first Purple Heart, I think right before September 12th. Got a few more that day. And then it just... It's like clusters, man. We would get four in a week and then none. And at this point, none of them were, only one of the guys got sent home. The very first guy, as a matter of fact, it just got so deep in his thigh and it went down and, and lodged down close to his This was a grenade trap? Grenade trap. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. much all grenade trap. Pretty much all grenade yeah. trap. Yeah. Were you guys able to neutralize uh, any of them during this time or was it most pretty lopsided on your end, casualty-wise? I'd say pretty lopsided. Yeah. And then once we got better and kind of, you know, you, you learn the terrain, you get comfortable with it. Like, all right, think like the enemy. And I, I don't think we ever caught up. I'm not confident saying that. But, uh, you know, as the months went on, we got as, as many of them as they did of us. Yeah. Except we were, they were injuring our guys. We were killing their guys. Yeah. Was it mostly uh, like Overwatch type shit or how, like how were you managing to get them? That Overwatch, uh, sometimes as crazy as it sounds, it was, it was bait. Like we would go and, you know, drop guys off and, you know, like right, when they drop guys off the Bradleys, when they leave and go that way, they're going back home. Well, we would just go and take a different direction and kind of come back in behind them. And we would have dropped off an overwatch position before that. And so, you know, they would see our guys would be walking and they would, you know, kind of come up the other side here. But what they didn't know is we had dropped off a group of guys over here before and they would pop out. I mean, that's just one way, but, uh, yeah, it was just, 
it was just constant, man. It was grenades, yeah. and then they would have the big coordinated attack ambush. You know, about a month after that. Any any big uh, injuries or or big ticket items <clears throat> in that one? No, I think probably the biggest takeaway from that, and I talk about it uh, in the book, was we were walking one day and these two idiots chucked a couple of grenades at us and guys at the rear of my formation popped them. And uh, so went back over and it was in this trash pile at the kind of this <clears throat> weird intersection right by the cemetery over there. And it kind of came to a V and uh, the very tip of up there was just nothing but trash. There's these two guys one of them, we look at him, we're like, I mean, he's dead. And then the other guy, he's, he's alive, yelling at us, you know, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Uh, so I tell the doc, the medic, like, you know, hey, patch him up. And uh, so I'm down on a knee, and one of my team leaders is kind of, the rest of the guys, we put in overwatch positions and got the Bradleys established security. So the medic's patching this guy up here on my left, and literally, you know, I mean, I could reach out over here, like the end of the table, this other guy is uh, face down, and you could tell it was, uh, he'd been shot in the head. And I just hear this horrible sound. And so I, I kind of look over at him and this dude's like, just lifts his head out of the trash. And you just see this huge hole in his head right here and just starts making this, you know, God awful, God -awful noise. And uh, and I had just told the team leader, uh, Corpy is what, Corporal Burgess. And I was like, hey, Corpy, you know, tell them, because my company radio was, was messed up. So I was having him relay on the mic to one of the Bradleys. I'm like, yeah, tell... <laughs> Tell HQ, you know, one enemy KIA, one enemy w, WIA. And that guy stuck his head up. I'm like, shit, man, tell him, you know, I guess two WIA. <clears throat> so he does. And then the guy just face plants again, you know, back into uh, the trash. I'm like, all right, he's dead. Let's hold on a second. <laughs> and so then I'm sitting here talking to the medic and the translator's over there. And I'm like, what's this guy saying? Again, all my focus is on this guy. And then I just hear that sound again. And I look down <clears throat> and the guy had lifted his head up. And I don't know how he did it, but he reached up and stuck his fingers in that hole in his head and was just pulling it up and he was doing it. You literally just blood and brain was just pouring out. And I just remember this, you know, and I turned and looked at Corpy and he looked at me and we both just went, holy shit. And, uh, and, and I, I tell that story because I think that was the moment when I got back to my room, maybe, even that, maybe at that exact moment that I'm like, dude, I'm never, like that's you can't unsee something like that yeah and uh you know i just uh i think the cold callous nature of who i was becoming from seeing that stuff every day uh that was the catalyst moment that really made that sink in is that something you that image do you have it regularly do you still think about that often yeah sometimes uh not in a bad way i think it's almost maybe more of a reminder and you know, like a lot of guys i got a bunch of tattoos and one of them is this thing and it's kind of in a way symbolic of that moment because it's just that reminder of what uh, I think all all men uh, really all people but especially men are capable of the the violence and the evil that we're capable of, be, of being and becoming and, and or have been and that you know I never want to be that again but I don't want to forget that I'm capable of it type yeah. deal yeah what what was he shot with just an M4 or? It's an M4 yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming he ended up dying, right? Man, that guy, apparently he died. You, know, you can't lose track of him, but uh, we took him down to the cache like we do all prisoners or, or, or bad guys that we shot. And the word we got is that he survived three days before wow. he passed. Yeah. God, we're like, man. how in the hell, man? Half the guy's brain was in our Bradley, you know, because yeah. we, uh, yeah, it was, it was nuts, man. And the other guy made it? He made it. And again, I don't know if we ever yeah. got any intel out of him or not. You know, it's, yeah, you think you're doing all these great things. You're getting, you know, information from insurgents, and half the time it's just you've had enough people on your show. You know, yeah, they're just feeding you shit. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the rest of that deployment, it sounds like you just continued to kind of do that uh, until yeah. you left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, on and off. You know, after the elections in January of '05, things kind of started to slow down, and you know, we took a lot of pride. We at one point, we were not allowed to go down Grenade Alley or Purple Heart Lane, you know, for obvious reasons. And uh, and then at the end, we were and like so I got all these cool pictures of us, like you know, standing at the, you know, like holding up the American flag, like you know, fuck you guys, we, you know, you brought it, you brought it good. We got to give you credit, but uh, you know, we're out here now, yeah, and uh, and you guys aren't. I think maybe to kind of close that deployment up, uh, you know, it's so 34 men under me, uh, 27 Purple Hearts. 
for injuries. Two guys had three Purple Hearts. Uh, three of the guys ended up getting sent home, you know, from their injuries, and uh, one of them, you know, still has you know permanent disability from uh, from his injury. You know, but we didn't lose anybody. Uh, the overall task force I was a part of lost five guys, but took a lot of pride in that my platoon and our company didn't lose anyone. Yeah. But then about a month before we headed home is, uh, and I'd mentioned Adam earlier from my IOBC class. He was with 10th Mountain, but they had been attached to 1st Cav. And he was in the sector north of Hyper Street a couple of miles, which might as well have been a different fucking country, you know, the way we stick to our AOs. And so it was on a, it was on February, I think it was like February 23rd or 25th. I opened up my email and had an email from his wife. And it was just like, if you haven't heard, Adam was killed on February 19th. And so for me, you know, that was uh, the task force. You know, you know who the guys are. You see them around the base. But that was the first, like, and this was my battle buddy. You know, me and this guy spooned every night together, you know, out in the field training. And, you know, in a relatively short period of time had come, become very close. And yeah. so that was a... Uh, that was a gut punch, man. Yeah. What uh, did that impact your time? The rest of your time there? Did you fight different? Did you think different? No, I think uh, no. I, I think I compartmentalized everything. Uh, that's one thing I took a lot of pride in was the stuff going on back home with the marriage. It was on again, off again. The stuff with Adam. You know, always. Uh, you know, again, prided myself that ability to flip the switch of. You know, that, yeah, I got some shit going on in my life personally, but as soon as I let it invade this space, then I'm putting all these men at risk, yeah. and I, I won't do that. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you find out news of that. Um, you continue to, to fight on in the deployment, doing similar thunder runs and just kind of recon by fire slash recon. Um, you go home. What What was that experience like going home and getting back into civilian life? I know for me... That's one ding that I would put on the on the military, uh, especially back then. I know they're a little better about it now, but is that you know you go from sustained combat operations to literally thirty six hours later, you're in your own bed, fucking grabbing a Slurpee at Seven Eleven. Like that's a, a fucking yeah. bad, yeah, bad way to integrate back in. What what was that like for you? Yeah, man, it's uh, same <clears throat> deal. You come in, hey, here's your. 10 days, seven days, whatever it was, decompression, go to these briefs, you know, answer the survey, or you having nightmares, blah, blah, blah. All right, now you're off for 30 days, 30 days leave. And, uh, you know, for me, it was about, you know, Chrissy and I had made the decision, like, hey, let's try to make this marriage thing work. And, and we did. So it was all about the marriage. And, you know, it was a tough deployment, but, man, we came out of that thing, like, on cloud nine, man. Like, we did. Like, this is the shit we trained for. This is what we signed up for. We had a, You hear about IEDs and all this stuff going around. We didn't have much of that. Like, we had an enemy we could shoot back at. Yeah. So we came back feeling pretty damn good about what we had just done. And for me, the next step was, you know, and I'll probably go be an XO for a little bit. But as soon as I came back, it was SF. At this point, you know, I could have made the decision to go back to Ranger School. But I was a first lieutenant, and you got to be a first lieutenant promotable uh, to go to FSA, SFAS. And so I started putting together my packet for that. And so I guess we took got home in March, leave all of April. As soon as we came back in May, they moved me over to go be the XO of Charlie Company. And while I hadn't served directly, and we were on the same base, fought with those guys. I knew all of them. They knew all of me. So it was a... It was like, all right, come be an XO, do your SF stuff, you know, get it ready. And when the time comes, thanks for everything. And so 1-9 CAV had been traditional siloed. Like 1-9 was all infantry. And the decision was made that 1st CAV, I'm sure other units did it, were moving to these combined arms battalions. So you were going to have two infantry companies, two tank, uh, two tank companies, an engineer company, whereas we had three infantry companies in 1-9. And so I was the XO and they was like, all right, you guys are gonna go be a part of 1-8 now and in time we'll transition. So instead of being Charlie 1-9, you're gonna go over and be Bravo 1-8. So they had this big, re they took 1-9 and reflagged it out to Fort Bliss. And so we became Bravo 1-8 and I guess it was July, I think, 2000, 2005. And then you know, we're not doing anything. I mean, we're hell, half the guys just scatter to the wind, guys get out of the army. So that 135 man infantry company is now down to about 50 guys. And then, uh, Hurricane Katrina 
happens late August. So we get sent down uh, to New Orleans for a couple of weeks to help out with that. How was that? You know, it was uh, surreal, man. Uh, it, it really was. Like, you just drive in and, you know, you're you're four months removed from being in, in Baghdad. And you're looking around and going, shit, some of this. Now, I wasn't in the Ninth Ward. We were in Algiers. Relatively, uh, you know, it, it was hit hard, but it wasn't flooded. And But we got to go over and see some of the, the other areas. Uh, but, yeah, man, it was just like, holy shit, how does something like this happen in our country? I feel like I'm in a third world country again. Yeah. So you're there for a couple of weeks? A couple of weeks, came back, and then as soon as we came back, uh, that's when I was informed that my company commander, this guy, Chris Ford, uh, who was just a stud, man. I mean, all the, all the men loved him. The guy was, uh, he was just awesome. And Chris was making the decision to uh, leave active duty. And what that set up was because we had gone from 1-9 to 1-8, well, 1-8 was traditionally uh, a tanker or armor battalion. And so uh, they had no infantry captains in the queue to take command. And so the battalion commander and brigade commander sat me down and said, hey, you know, based off of Chris's recommendation, uh, we know you want to go do your SF thing, but uh, we'll let you take command just because, you know, we don't have anybody else. Hey, it's a great resume bullet, you know, got command as a first lieutenant, but I'm like, shit, there's no one else to do it. (laughs) And uh, Promoted due to vacuum. Yeah, yeah. uh, but hey, so it's uh, so I'm like, yeah, why not, man? They're like, you know, we'll let you stay in at least 90 days, even if a captain shows up. That way, you can get rated, and you'll have this in your service record. And I'm like, <clears throat> outstanding. So I take command in October of 2005. So I was platoon leader for nine months. I was an XO for five months, and then uh, company commander as a first. Not, I'm not even a first lieutenant promotable at this point. Just a first lieutenant, and. Uh, so yeah, we started getting new soldiers at this point, and you know it was kind of building back up, and uh, did some training events, nothing crazy. Found out right after I took command that uh, uh, that Chrissy, my wife at the time, that she was pregnant, and then not long after that, uh, about a month after that, we're like, hey, we pretty much know when we're going to deploy next. It's going to be next fall time frame. I'm like, all right, it's fine. I'm going to be off at Fort Bragg doing my thing there. Well, then uh, early 2006. Sure enough, an infantry captain shows up at headquarters one day, and I get called to uh, to the boss's office, and I figured this is going to be a, you know, thanks for everything you did. And instead, they said, well, you know, it's not completely set, but we think we know where we're going this next deployment. And, uh, you know, 1-8 had been, and they had seen some action the first deployment, but nothing like we had seen. And they said, we like the idea of having a, a combat-tested group and a leadership group that's been together in some tough times. So then when we get there, we can kind of put you guys, you know, tip of the spear, per se. So they said, if you'll pull your SF packet or delay it, you know, we'll give you all the recommendations in the world when we come back to try to get a waiver to go through as a captain. But if you'll do that, we'll let you stay in command and take the company back to Iraq. So it was a no-brainer uh, so made that decision the only downside was we thought we were going to be having a baby me going off to school for a couple of years instead and it was going to have a baby and me deploy again yeah so was your first was that child born while you're on deployment or before? right before so he was born july 2006 <clears throat> and we deployed in october oh, okay yes yeah, so it was uh, almost it was just over three months yeah I'm assuming that went over like a fart in a spacesuit with the uh, the old lady right <laughs> you know you know, we had our moments, obviously, you know, like any couple does. But, you know, I will say that uh, that year plus that I was home was the best year we ever had. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, it was hard. Her knowing she was going to have to do that first year on her own. Wasn't planning for it. But uh, I, I left on a – I left and we were on a good note. Yeah. For me, it was the – that's saying goodbye, man. You know, I talked earlier about flipping the switch. And, uh, man, that was a switch that – uh, man, saying saying goodbye to that boy, you know, just walking out to the car, man, after seeing what had happened before, and just the, I think, you know, you're a dumbass first go around. You hear about stuff can happen, but it's different when you see it. And so here I am, just go around and knowing what could happen, uh, just hit me like a ton of bricks, man. Yeah. Did that? So did being a, a father now? Did that change uh, how you did did things? Did it make you uh, more apprehensive or change how you how you led, how you fought? No, no. Again, I, I'll, I'll take pride in that. Like it was, you know, I, I wasn't 
more risk adverse or anything of that nature. <clears throat> it was, I think maybe it was more, I don't know, empathetic of the, the family side of things that, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, probably 50% of them do have wife and kids back home. So maybe a little bit more understanding of somebody just having a bad day. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So you have a child three months later, you deploy again. Now you're back right in the thick of it. Uh, was there a familiarity uh, that existed? Was anything different? Uh, how did it feel once you got back there? And it was, it could not have been any more different. Really? Uh, it was a couple of things. So about two months before we deployed, I got a new E6 in one day and that weekend, you know, we in process and Hey, welcome to the unit. We're going to do great things that weekend. I get a call that, uh, you know, from a hospital, like, Hey, we have one of your soldiers dude was went out, got drunk, didn't know anybody in town and got hit by a car and died. Holy fuck. Yeah. And then the weekend before we left, uh, we had an unfortunate alcohol related incident. And one of my young soldiers was, uh, you know, it was a going away party. And, uh, you know, out of respect for his family, I maybe won't get into all the details, but yeah, alcohol was involved. And, uh, by the time he made it to the <clears> hospital, <throat> he was brain dead and he was brain dead because one of the other guys gave him mouth to mouth and at least kept him functional, the paramedics, you know, so here we are, we're leaving on a, you know, on a Thursday or whatever it was and Saturday night, Sunday morning, you know, up at the hospital. And basically we stayed there and they kept him alive long enough for his parents to drive down from Colorado and make the decision to pull the plug. How old you know, was he? Uh, probably 22 or 23. Fuck. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, so we kind of started, it just felt different from the get go, this excitement and eagerness of the unknown going into the first one. Now it's like, well, man, this already sucks. Yeah. Uh, then we get there and these are 12 month deployments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. <clears throat> So we get there, we do the Kuwait thing, and then I have to go up to uh, uh, up north to Taji for this counterinsurgency class that they sent all commanders to, uh, which was actually kind of cool. Not that they're teaching you anything; it's the people they have come in, like guys that uh, interrogated Saddam and other. You know, it's pretty enlightening stuff. And then went down and you know met the unit back in Baghdad, and I was back in Baghdad again over in eastern Baghdad, right outside Sadr city. Uh, well. The FOB was FOB Rustamaya, which is a little south, but my AO ended up being outskirts of Sider City. But just right off the bat, man, it was different. It was all IEDs and snipers. And that's the first time we started hearing about EFPs. You know, we hadn't had to deal with that my first deployment. And you're, uh, you know, you're asking the unit that we're doing the left seat, right seat rides with of what about raids and ops? You're like, no, man, now here it's all about... 24 7 <clears throat> coverage so we never go out as a company we like split platoons and go up and i'm like well, we want this to be hyper street again man we go out and chase bad guys and you know kick down doors and stuff and realize that that wasn't what it was going to be like and uh and just to sort of amplify how shitty of a start it got off to so as we're halfway through the left seat right seat rides to get the announcement for the surge and uh, my bosses, they come in and say, Hey, just go ahead and let your men know this 12 month deployment is now going to be 15. And we got here in November. Uh, so we knew we were going to miss one Thanksgiving and Christmas. And now we're going to miss two Thanksgivings and two Christmases. And that's another kick in the dick. And then, uh, yeah, the last day of the left seat, right seat rides, it wasn't my company. It was our engineer company. It was out with the engineer company that they were going to be swapping with. And by left seat, right seat, you mean like turnover? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the first week, <clears throat> you know, we replace. You've been there the year before me, so the first week you're driving and I'm in the passenger seat and you're showing me the routes. And then the second week we flip-flop. And so this was the second week of that with the outgoing unit. And it was literally the – I mean, a lot of their unit had already shipped off to Kuwait. And there were a few people that were left to do the final right seat, left seat rides. And on the way back, they were hit by an EFP. And – uh one eight who I was a part of, we lost one guy, but the unit we were replacing, they lost two. And just like these guys were hours away from getting on a plane to go to Kuwait to be out here. I mean, their ship was packed up. Yeah. And now they're dead. God damn, man. That is a kick in the dick. It's tough to even hear fucking 14 years later. Yeah. Um, so obviously that had a negative <clears throat> mental impact in conjunction with 
it sounds like you know uh, Al Qaeda insurgents, etc., uh, had adapted quite a bit since the last time you were there, and, and yeah. had refined their operations to be far more both lethal, deadly, and and also uh, mentally anguishing from the sounds of it. Because to me. Yeah. Sniper and IED stuff fucks with your head way fucking more than getting grenades thrown at you. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, did you ever hear about the? Uh, and I'm sure you did. Silly question, but the 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 Juba sniper and the video that he made that mm-hmm. made his rounds. Yeah, it was. You know, it's like a train wreck. You know, you, you get wind of this thing, and everyone tells you, man, you don't want to watch this. So the unit before us had it, and then our S2 shop got a hold of it, and they're like, if if you see your men with this, turn it off. Don't let them see it. Of course, you see it, you watch it. And it's it like was the two ch- chicks in one cup, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah, your friend told you about yeah. it, right? Uh, actually, all this damn coronavirus stuff now, everybody going around with the the big dude. Have you been? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's <laughs> turned into the blonde chick and the cat meme, <laughs> yeah. for fuck's sake. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> but no, so it was uh, basically, it was just this kind of eerie music, and it was this guy reading off basically about infidel and jihad and shit like that and uh then it was just uh filming american service members being killed by a sniper okay i've, I've seen yeah. a fair bit of that footage i'm sure yeah. some of it's from that but. yeah yeah and so that started ma- so yeah that shit it was messing with guys heads you know and yeah. everybody out patrolling i'm sure we look like freaking idiots but they tell you like hey when you're out never walking and you know bob and weave when you're walking so we're out trying to conduct patrols or like you're talking out, you're- to yeah just, you're all fucking Michael Jackson thriller. <laughs> yeah, it shit, no, 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 man. I need more <laughs> drinks than me to, uh, but yeah, so it was, uh, but yeah, it was just, it was just different, man. And my, my battalion commander, that deployment, uh, brilliant man. And one of the things that we had to learn on Hyper Street was, you know, you were trained up for, for a conventional warfare. You know, now guys the last 10 years have been trained to fight in those areas. But when I went through training, like, hey, we're still going to fight the Soviets, man. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so you adapt and there's the way, then there's the other way. And we had to learn to find the other way. And so just my natural instincts as a leader were to always, when I looked at terrain and enemy, it was like, you know, all right, the book says I should do this, but my experience tells me I need to do that. And he had been in a staff position, my battalion commander. And so some of my ideas that I would run by him, he would just, you know, just belittle me for being stupid. But I give him credit. You know, he, as much as I, you know, guy pissed me off sometimes, he would just tell me how dumb I was, whatever, whatever. But it was like, but go do it your way. And he always let me know. I got to give the man credit for that. It's like he had to You're a fucking point. idiot, but yeah. I'm going to let you do it. Yeah, yeah. But what it, <laughs> but what it showed was, you know, there was one raid in particular. And I remember he had me come in. And uh, and it was weird why he did it. He had me go in and, like, brief my plan. Uh, and he had the whole scout platoon in there that were going to get attached to my men. And so I did it. And, again, some of it was the, you know, divide and conquer where it may seem kind of crazy, but... I'm like, you know, sir, if, if we go do the thing and occupy this space, they're just going to trickle out and we're not going to get them. So I'm going to take less people and you can call it risky, but we're going to, and sure enough, they're going to come out and my guys are going to catch them on the outskirts. And I briefed it and it just in front of the whole scout platoon, I'm like, Jeff, this is a fucked up plan. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, sir, you know, Did trust he sound me. like Mitch McConnell or something? Like <laughs> well, we left. His name was Jeff too. And, yeah. uh, so he, he's six seven. So he was, he was big Jeff, and I was little Jeff. And he always had this thing: Jeff, what the fuck? Was how he started half our conversations. <laughs> uh, but so yeah, so sure enough, things went well that night, and our plan we ended up catching some guys. And you know, it took a little bit of time, but I, I got to give a guy credit. He was like, you know, all right, uh, you show me your way, and so I'm going to kind of be hands off now. But you know, again, we didn't do many ops like that. It was just drive around, and they were. You know, before we'd go out for an hour on Haifa Street and go hit a house and then get out or a 20 minute thunder run, you know, here was, you know, split your platoons up. And uh, I had to detach one of my platoons to a completely different battalion, which sucked after training up with these guys for so long. Uh, but then it was go drive around. You had to have 24 7 presence in your sector. And so they were eight hour shifts, man. Just go out and, and you talk about trying to polish a turd, man. You know, when you get these EFPs of, and, uh, you know, and for your listeners, I'm sure you obviously ever knows what an EFP is, but then these guys were so smart, man, how they would disguise them in jersey barriers and, you know, just 
cut out a chunk of cement, you know, off the off the side of the road and, and pack six little ones in there. You know, we had three bangers, six bangers, nine bangers, and the things were crazy what they were doing. And for me to tell, you know, all right, Mike, I want you to go drive around for eight hours. And uh, it was a it was a, t- it was a leadership challenge, man. To what are we doing here? Well, yeah. So that's two questions. One, where were you guys at in comparison to Haifa Street? Uh, and also, did you or anybody else ever say, "Why the fuck are we driving around <laughs> in, in this area? Like, there's smarter ways to do this." Yeah. So we were uh, this time. I was in Eastern Baghdad. So we were across the the t- other side of the Tigris River, and Fab Rustamaya was down a little bit further south. And then <clears throat> as part of the surge, and so we got to Rustamaya, my AO was up the, the furthest away from the FOB, and it was up kind of in the outskirts of Sadr City, uh, up where uh, I, th- I think it was, was 2-5, had the big uh, 2-5 cab back in 04, the big uprising that took place, the old base they occupied. And so we patrolled up around that area. And this was a part of town that hadn't seen American forces for you know, since that ship went down in 04, well, I guess early 05. Uh, but, you know, we had some, I mean, we, we were told not to go into Sodder City. Uh, some parts we could trickle in just our routes, but at the time they didn't let them air. Only the special ops guys operated up in there. And so we would get things of, hey, we need you to go pull security here. There's a raid going on. And so we'd, I'd get a phone call from some dude, just be like, call me John. I need you to be here, 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 here at this time. I'll call you on this frequency when we're done. All right, cool, dude. And so we did a lot of that. Uh, and I have no idea who or what those guys were, were doing up in Sodder City. Any notable uh, mix-it-ups during those times? No, man. There was a, you know, we had our first, we'd probably been there about a month. First vehicle was hit by an EFP, and it kind of, you know, luckily it wasn't a direct hit. But it showed us the power. So we, like, went off up off the turret and, I mean, just took out, like, a big chunk of metal off that thing. And, like, man, that thing just skirted it and did that. Yeah. And then, for, for those of you listening, you civilian assholes, because you know I love you. Uh, the EFP is essentially a, it's a, a super IED. Uh, I think it stands for Electric Form Penetrator, something like that. But if if you want to explain it, you know you, you've been hit by them. I haven't, so <laughs> by all means, be my guest. Yeah, it's, it's a shape charge. It's the most simplest way, and I'm sure there's a lot more technology. Is picture a paint can and then pack it with C4 and then take a copper plate and they put it in this machine that kind of indents it down just a little bit. And so when the C4 detonates, it takes that that concave plate and it turns it into just a molten slug yeah. that can penetrate any armor. So a traditional IED, you're thinking- Omni. Wild, yeah, shrapnel going everywhere. Here, the slug is designed to hit the vehicle and it's the vehicle that in turn becomes a shrapnel. Yeah. The other thing to think of too is that the the power from explosives is 360. It's, you know, multi-directional. With this, that, that concave that he's talking about, imagine, say, a wine bottle at the bottom of it, how it kind of goes up is that, uh, that that's kind of what the bottom uh, or the back of the charge looks like. And so it, it has an ability to, to kind of channel a lot of the the explosive power and, and utilize much more of, of the actual explosion in one direction instead mm-hmm. of every every which fucking way you know, like a like a sphere this is going more like a bullet and, and it's turning you know there, there was a an instance of one being used on uh, um, or tr- one was tried to be used on the Pope uh, there was an Italian banker that got smoked by one years ago that they used a fucking manhole cover uh, so you can imagine a, a manhole cover uh, traveling at twenty six thousand feet per second, you mm-hmm. know, straight straight up into the fucking bottom of a vehicle, and very quickly you realize even in tanks and things that are, are meant to be able to withstand explosions, uh, it'll punch right through them and fucking destroy everything inside it. So anyway, just yep. so, so that you know, for those of you that don't, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. So some of them sometimes they would be, uh, and again, man, these these assholes were smart. You know, they they. They would realize that, uh, you know, so we have obviously ways we counter it. And so they would put infrared streamers on them. And so no one's there with a cell phone or a little button to press. Like, you know, you tee it up and then when the vehicle drives by, it hits the infrared and then boom. So we counter that with, we put these long extensions on the front of our vehicles. So if it blew up, it would hit that. So they counter with, okay, once the infrared's hit, a five second delay. So it was always this cat and mouse game going back. And <clears throat> Then they realized, you know, like where uh, on a Bradley in an M1, you know, M1 tank, uh, where the fuel cells were. 
And so they would put them down to the ground at an angle to angle up. And so at Bradley, we didn't have the type of armor that could stop these things. If it, if it had time to fully turn into that slug, it was going to go through any part of the Bradley. But sometimes it would be kind of short, so it wouldn't have time if you want to call it fully armed. So like we had one instance where it was probably the second or third time we'd been hit. This guy was sitting in the back in one of the, one of the dismounts in the back of the Bradley eating his chow and the thing blew up and it hit the, you know, we have the reactive armor on the side of our Bradleys that explodes out, but it created such a loud explosion and it kind of dented in the side of the Bradley and like the guy, like everyone gave him shit because his face went down his food. Uh, <laughs> He's napping on the job. Yeah, but they realized that, and I'm sure they had sources that, you know, a vehicle can be destroyed without burning to the ground. Like if it went through and penetrated the, 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 the core, the hole, of any of our vehicles, uh, we would have to code that Bradley and we'd be down a Bradley. And so they got real smart on figuring out where to hit these things. And everyone says, oh, the M1 has this armor that can't be penetrated. Well, it can, because I've seen it, and especially if you do it from the right angle, and it was all these EFPs. So we, uh, it started increasing some, but it wasn't that bad up until early 2007. And then that's when the call as part of the surge was to go live out amongst the people, go find a patrol base, and uh, you talk about a fart in church, man. Let me, let me go to 150 you know, <clears throat> dudes and, hey, you've enjoyed this room where you come in, you got internet in your room at night, and you can watch all the porn you want and do whatever. Now we're going to go live out, and you know, we may have to sleep out in the open for a couple of nights while we find a place to live. Uh, we was that bought, a huge morale uh, kick in the junk? Too? Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, that was probably the one time, my first sergeant, man, that guy, we could – talk about him for hours man the dude is just a fucking legend and uh one of my best friends was one of the best men in my wedding uh it's incredible relationship but that was one of the few times where he and i really butted heads because you know i'm like dude this is where i need you to you know I, I don't like this any more than you do man but i need you to stand by me and and deliver this message and he was like this is all fucked up sir you know i can't be doing this i'm like no buddy that was ultimately petraeus's idea right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. What, looking back on it what uh what's your perspective on it now everybody you know revisionist history all i know is from my perspective and i'll speak for that because that's all i can that's all i can is they announced the surge uh we got attacked a hell of a lot more once we moved out to that patrol base. Now, one thing to factor in, then we went to an area. So we went and lived on that base that 2-5 Cab had lived on. And no one had been there since the Americans two years before, except for an Iraqi security company that ironically was being led by a, an ex-CAG guy. Hmm. And a good dude, really good dude, good friend of mine to this day. <clears throat> and they told us, like, all right, so now our AO expanded up a little bit further outside of Sadr City. And all the locals said, whatever you do, don't go up past the street. That's where all the Iranians are. They're like, of course, you tell us not. Hell yeah, we're going to go up there. And once we started patrolling up there, that's when the shit really hit the fan. And so back to your question about my thoughts on it, it was uh, we got our ass kicked for a while. And it stopped not when... We killed a lot of them. It stopped when, again, in my AO, when Sadr came out that August and said, stop attacking the Americans and they'll leave. And that's when it stopped. Yeah. So to me, I maybe more out west towards Ramadi and you know the Al-Qaeda, some of those guys that flipped the Sunni piece, they're able to bring in back into the table. But where I was at in that Shi area, I, I didn't see anything. Yeah. So, you know, 30,000 foot, big picture view, you're Petraeus. Do you make that call to, to do it again? I think you have to. I mean, my, my situation, I think, is probably a bit unique. Uh, there were successes, again, out west. I think getting the Sunnis more of a seat at the table uh, was a key outcome of that. Uh, but I also think there was a certain piece of it that it was, and who knows, maybe this is all kind of brokered behind the scenes and some type of deal of, you know, hey, we're going to do this. You guys do that, and then peace out. We'll leave in a couple of years. Let's calm the shit down. No one's winning. Yeah, I, I remember very distinctly um, when that that push got uh, got put out. I was a, an instructor at the time, you know, so still on active duty. Still had a lot of friends that were mixing it up, and I, I remember my my dad and I, who I guarantee <coughs> is fucking listening right now. What's up, pop and ma? <laughs> um, is that? Uh, you know, I remember him asking me, like, you know, that seems like a fucking 
dicey thing to do like what what is your take on that and i said i i think it's a fucking huge mistake honestly mm-hmm. i said it in in my opinion it's going to be an absolute fucking bloodbath and i think it's a huge mistake that's that's what i thought at the time but uh, it sounds like you know some places it was some places it was it was successful but well for mine it was the uh the bloodbath for sure we're getting yeah. ready to to get, get into, into that, it yeah. So, yeah um and you would say <clears throat> is is it safe to assume uh, or ascertain i guess that uh, the trouble that you guys had was overwhelmingly iranian i think it was a uh, at least I, iranian influence yes yes yeah, yeah yeah i think that was a huge i think they you know proxy through and i'm sure there were some iraqis what's what ended up being so that iraqi security company that i mentioned with the cad guy that was headed it up uh his right hand man uh, they said he was one of you know, Sadr, Muqtada al Sadr, for your, said it was one of his cousins. Now we know cousin over there could be one of 5,000. Exactly. People. Yeah. But so it was, it was almost surreal is, and these guys openly talked about it. These were the guys that fought the Americans in 2004. Now they're sharing a base with us because we all have a common enemy. They don't want the Sunni coming in. This is right. The sectarian conflict, 2006. I mean, we would find, you know, there was a Sunni that lived on the street. They would tell him to leave. He wouldn't leave. You know, the next day we'd find him tortured with a drill bit. You know, like to send a message. So there was some wild shit going on. All the all the bad stuff we saw the first few months was Iraqi on Iraqi. Yeah. Then the Iranian piece. Once we started going up in that area, and those were some of the dudes saying, "Man, don't don't go mess with those guys. Man, that's just that's not going to end well for any of us." Uh, and so that was probably February. And then we're living up there, driving up roads, and no Americans had been on in a while. And that's when the EFPs, man, were just left and right. Yeah. Uh, Bef- before you got to that point, just the initial part of the surge, I know you guys got attacked a lot. Did you lose anybody? Did, were there no. s- severe? It was just fucking with you more than anything. Yeah, a couple of mild injuries. Uh, you know, one guy, and we had one guy that got shot, and he was actually shot by uh, some other unit, some military police rolling through and rolled up and thought they saw something and shot one of my guys yeah uh, it's crazy blue on blue huh? yeah, yeah yeah and but now just uh s- some minor injuries uh, nothing nothing major and again this all it escalated very quickly yeah uh, starting in february and i remember you know we you know you see some of the things that efps can do obviously uh but it was we rolled up you know we heard this loud boom up we were i was because you would stay at your patrol base and you would go back to Rusta Meyer for a couple of days of refit and then come back for two weeks out there. So I was on the way back and we just heard this loud boom and like it, you can almost feel the pressure change. <clears throat> and we roll up and uh, this Iraqi police unit had been driving through there, wrong place, wrong time. And this EFP had hit just a regular Humvee with no up armor or anything. And we rolled up, man. I mean, just this hole, open the door, just disemboweled just shit and you're just like man once you see what one of those things can do uh as if we didn't respect it enough uh we damn sure did now yeah so yeah so that happened and then uh you know every now and then we got intel i said we didn't do a lot of raids and this was one time we kept hearing the same name of this dude and uh was it Suleimani? no 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 no. i I can't remember this guy i started with an s i think i purposely forgot it just because that was shit times but i am curious now that he's been fucking killed uh was that name prominent no back no no we never we just kept hearing about the iranians we yeah. never heard about uh any name this is an iraqi guy that was running stuff through town and there were obviously some iraqis working with the iranians and that was and again i don't know if this shit's right or not i'm just telling you what the people on the ground told us is the iranians they come in they got their people here they work with a lot of these shia that are loyal to them so they got people in different pockets of the city, but their sort of hub to get stuff into Baghdad is that area they told us not to go to. He's like, that's where they make the plates. That's where they build a lot of the stuff. We never found shit. And again, that's just what, what they told us. Yeah. Okay. And, and so this was some Iraqi that had been working with the Iranians apparently. And so then one night uh, we got word that uh, they had a pretty good idea where he was at. He was visiting some family in RAO. So my company got sent out to go get him and uh, you know, it's not like you guys, man. You don't go in and little birds and drop in real quick. You know, we drive in a big ass Bradley. So we have to like go and court on off this huge area and then search 60 houses. And uh, but we ended up finding the guy, but it took all damn night. And that was on March 14th where we started that raid. 
and uh, late that evening. And the next day, we had a mission with the Iraqi army that just all bullshit and political things had gotten. I was required to have two platoons at it, really for a photo op, just to go and like be on the outskirts of Sadr City, Americans and Iraqi forces next to each other. And, you know, no shit, I was told, like, make sure you get a lot of good pictures. And that was... Who the fuck told you that? Your leadership? Yeah, yeah. That was the... uh, Things were, again, back to things being very different. Uh, So, yeah, so I'm out with two of my platoons uh, that night. And I actually had another platoon attached to me for another company. Just because when my my third platoon was back at Rustin Meyer refitting. And uh, so, yeah, I had second platoon, then I had the platoon from Charlie Company over there and uh, our headquarters platoon. So we're out all night. So once I realized this is going to be a long night, I called up higher and said, hey, can I get relief on that mission tomorrow? Just let me have one platoon. I'll send third platoon out with them. Let me take care of all the shit with these guys. And they were like, you know, no, denied. Like, all right. So an hour later, you know, back on the net, hey, we're still out here. You know, these guys are going to be up all night. So this goes on and on. And then I'm finally told that, no, I will have two platoons. And so we finally get this guy and, you know, at five in the morning, you know, whatever time it was, we have to drive him, second platoon has to drive him back to Rustamaya. We, we go back to our patrol base first, kind of refit real quick. All right, you guys take him back to Rustamaya. And at that point, they caved a little bit. And they said, okay, you don't have to send all of second platoon out for this photo op in third platoon only half of them. So all of second platoon went back to drop the prisoner off. And I was in the Humvee, was getting ready to roll out with them. And then I get a call, third platoon, they were running late, something of Bradley was broken. So I'm like, you know, hey, Sergeant Prater, stop the Humvee, I gotta figure this shit out. You know, Arnold, get your butt in here, take my place. And uh, so I go in, get on the net, kind of get everything figured out with third platoon and you know, how we're going to link up. But this is all at this point, the original plan is just sort of squashed. And it's like, these guys are here. How are we all going to meet up at the same place and get there? And uh, so I got all that set. And I'm like, all right, I can get about 30 minutes of shut eye real quick. And I've been up for, you know, probably 36 hours at that point. And uh, most everybody had not. And it's not some pity party for me. So I'll go and lay down and uh, tell the guys at the CQ. I'm like, you know, hey, whenever sex platoon uh, is you know, about halfway out here because they were coming back to get me. I was like, let me know. And uh, they had to get not just me, some other guys. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm laying down, I'm sleeping. And the guy comes in, he's like, hey, sir, second platoon was just hit. And I'm like, Is everybody okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, no casualties. And uh, they had this dumb thing, uh, again, just sensitive site exploitation. So we want to tell what kind of blast this is. Was it an IED or was it an EFP? So we want your guys... To go hanging out there some more. Yeah, yeah. So after the blast, if everyone's okay, you know, if the if you deem this, you know, the, the situation appropriate, we want you to get out, take measurements, and so that way the smart guys can analyze, you know, the blast piece of it. And if it's supposed to be a requirement, my, uh, my old boss is listening. He can get pissed at me now. My deal was, well, guys, we can't not do it every time because they're going to catch on to that real quick. So to me, it is the, the senior guy on the ground. It is your call. Don't ever call me for, you know, if, if, if you need to, do it. But you have the authority to make that decision on your own. And so on this day, uh, they were hit by an EFP. And it was when they were coming back, so it was a Bradley in the lead, two Humvees, then a Bradley, full of security. And the lead Bradley was hit. Uh, this is in Al Razul, Iraq, ironically on a road called Dead Girls Road, Dead Girl Road, and the vehicle was disabled. The dismounts got out from the Humvees uh, to go, you know, so they just they were going to snap some pictures. But the real reason they were getting out was to begin recovery operations on that Bradley, and then that's when a secondary uh, and we look for them. We know they do this, but you know they get a vote too sometimes, and this day they won. So a secondary IED went off, and you could tell this was coordinated uh, because this was a ball-bearing IED. And uh, so there were six men on the ground, and uh, all six were hit. Uh, Four were killed instantly, Staff Sergeant Terry Prater, Staff Sergeant Blake Harris, Sergeant Emerson Brand, and uh, Specialist Jimmy Arnold. And then two men were severely injured, Sergeant Ryan Green and our medic, uh, Sergeant Nicholas Leitner. And so... The reason 
those two, uh, so I heard so how this is going on from my perspective. I hear no one's hurt and I'm like, all right, cool. If anything happens, let me know. So, uh, I'm kind of laying there, kind of starting to wake up and then he comes running back in there. He's just like another IED went off. Uh, we have injuries. And that's all. Haul ass in there, get on the radio. And, uh, you know, nothing's worse than being that asshole. Like, give me a sip rep, give me a sip rep, you know? So, uh, my senior guy out there, I was just like, Sal, you know, when you can tell me, tell me what the fuck's going on. And I just leave him alone. We hear all this stuff going over the net and you realize it's not good. And, uh, so after the, the four dead, so one of the gunners, this kid, Jimmy Coon, and remember that name, uh, cause he's the one who did mouth to mouth on the kid before we left that kept him alive. So Jimmy gets out and goes over, realizes those four dudes are dead and uh, starts providing medical aid to the other, gets a tourniquet. Sergeant Green was a uh, amputee at that point. And uh, so the reason those two guys, you know, lived for the time being were because of what Coon did. So, I mean, it's just, you know, and like the guys did great, but some guys are losing their shit during a situation like this. And fortunately this took place right by one of the other companies patrol base. And so the Alpha Company guys got out there and kind of took over the situation. And their XO at the time, who was a very close friend with me, we had been platoon leaders during the first deployment. Uh, uh, he's just a great guy. His wife, crazy as it sounds, uh, his wife has delivered my last three children. She's oh, no a, shit. Yeah, a doctor here in town. And oh. So he kind of took over you know, what was going on. They got the guys to the brigade hospital, uh, brigade base in the hospital that was right there. And I'd been told at that point, you know, like, Hey, there's a KIA. Hey, there's multiple KIA. But again, it's a shit show, man. And no one, I'm like, do not say any names over the net. Don't do it. Uh, I don't want people freaking out. And, uh, and so Charlie just said, I'll let you know when I can. And so I'm everyone standing by waiting. And, uh, you know, he just totally broke protocol. He like came over the net and just said, and we had phones at our patrol base, you know, and it wasn't Legion six, you know, this is commando six. It was, you know, Jeff, this is Charlie. I'm about to call you. And that goes over the battalion net. So the phone rings and he was there and he picked it up. And that's when he told me the four guys names and, uh, which two were injured. And, uh, yeah, March 15th, man. Not a, was there a, a follow on attack or was it just the IEDs? Just the two IEDs. Yeah. Some people said they heard some pop shots on the ground. Uh, yeah. yeah. How, how long did it take to uh, get that under control? You said uh, the nearby was the Alpha Company came yeah. in and, and uh, kind of secured the perimeter, I guess, and, and helped. It Was it several hours to get? Yeah. So, again, you know, we're at our patrol base, you know, up here. The brigade headquarters is there and five rest of my is down here. So... I'm out here with a group of men, the body, the other men are here. Half of this platoon is here. The other half is refitting back at Rustamaya. So we got to, you know, get these pieces together, uh, and then back so we can, you know, there's certain things you got to take up, you know, their personal effects and all the shit that's got to go down. And, uh, so, you know, at that point I kind of said, you know, all right, you guys, let's, let's get over. So we went back to Rustamaya and they got the, the bodies down. Uh, back to Rustamaya, because that would be the, the life flight later that night. So we get back there, uh, linked up with my first sergeant, and, you know, as crazy as it sounds, you know, they, like, we, you know, we're, we're pretty sure it's kind of hard to mess this up, but, you know, it's just, do you guys, you know, can, can you go in and confirm the bodies to me and my first sergeant? So we're like, yeah. Uh, so we went in there, and, man, it was, uh, it was tough. Tough, man. It's dudes that... Like Sergeant Prater, uh, for example, he was with us the first deployment. I'd known him the longest. I'd met his wife, his two kids, and uh, dude won the Silver Star first deployment. Through his body, when they, one of his soldiers was injured, you know, in Haifa Street, one of those back alleys, another grenade comes over. He throws himself uh, in between the other soldier and gets a Silver Star and gets injured, gets sent home, uh, comes back, and you know, to die like that. Yeah, uh, yeah and there's never. And, and this sounds terrible, but a lot of military guys, and listeners, you'll get it. Like, you know, if you like went into the deployment and said, "All right, I'm going to lose ten. These are ten I don't want to lose. Yeah. These are ten like, all right, you don't want to say it, but these are ten. All right, we can get by without those guys. Uh, but nah, man, of these these four, man, they were just the the cream of the crop. 
in terms of the nature of their injuries, you said that it was a uh, ball bearing. Were, were they? Uh, I mean, what what were the natures? I mean, was it blast death? You know, from the blast? Was it from shrapnel? Was it a combination? It was. Uh, I mean, were they in really bad shape? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A couple of them were. Some were more, uh, and it was covered up. But and again, I won't say the names, just out of respect for those involved. But I mean, there was one in particular that it didn't take much imagination to see. I mean, literally like a perfect circle, yeah. you know, uh, and, you know, again, Sergeant Green, who was alive at the time, I mean, one of those, one of those ball bearings just, you know, blew part of his arm off. And, and, uh, and he's still alive? No. So, uh, you know, so you prepare that in that environment, you know, shit like that can happen, but you never expect four. Uh, but then you kind of, you know, all right, you got these other two dudes that are injured to kind of rally behind, you know, Sergeant Green. I mean, that dude was just the life of the company, man. I mean, the guy would like show up at PT in a Captain America outfit and like, you know, go and he would jump me after formations all the time. And I mean, just a hilarious dude, man. Love that guy. I always say every unit needs a Sergeant Green. I don't care what kind of unit, <clears throat> no higher compliment uh, can be said than that. So the day after we go and visit Sergeant Green and Sergeant Leitner in the hospital and Sergeant Green's kind of in a comatose state, uh, but he's alive. And Sergeant Leitner is actually awake, laughing, cutting up. Like we have some hilarious pictures. We had this dumb joke of like, you know, everyone, uh, our salute was the shocker salute. So yeah, all the guys called me shocker six when they would salute <laughs> me like that. And so our brigade commander, this guy, Brian Roberts, he shows up and uh, I guess didn't know what the shocker was. And so like Sergeant Leitner, they're putting a purple heart on him and Sergeant Leitner's like, you know, hey, you know, sir, can you do this? So there's our brigade commander, you know, <laughs> freaking hilarious. Uh, oh, that's fucking great. Yeah, man. And it was, uh, you know, it, it was sad to see Sergeant Green like that, but you're like, man, if anyone, that, that tough little fucker, man, he, he will come back from it. And uh, Leitner, man, he's good. He's doing the shocker with the colonel. So we're... We're all right. So that was on the 16th. And then uh, on the 18th, I got wind that uh, I got a phone call and uh, said, you know, it was my battalion commander and said, Jeff, are you alone? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, Sergeant Leitner made it back to Germany for medical treatment and he did not make it. He passed from his injuries. Green. Yeah, yeah. green. Yeah. So it's like, damn, man. Uh, I mean, the guys. Not that you're bouncing back in three days from losing the other four, but at least you're getting back to some sense of normalcy. Yeah. <clears throat> and like, so that was, uh, so I had a patrol out and I didn't say anything. I waited for them to, I knew they were on the way back in. When they came in, I called a formation and uh, let the men know. Uh, so that was on the 18th. We had a memorial on the 20th for the five guys. And, uh, you know, we've, we've all been to those things over there and uh, they're not fun. They're especially not fun when you're, given a speech for five yeah uh you know but we we did it and we went back to our barracks there at rustamaya afterwards and we laughed we cried we cut up you know told stories about the men and so you know man this is uh you know things are different but it's uh well let's get back on it and tomorrow let's do it let's start tomorrow and let's uh let's do it for our boys and uh well unfortunately tomorrow which was the 21st of march uh, i got another phone call and it was Hey Jeff, are you sitting down? I said, yeah. Leitner made it all the way back to the States and something happened and he passed. And so, you know, six dudes, all six gone. And uh, it's the same thing, wait a little bit, you know, let the guys come in, call the formation. And uh, yeah, man, it was, and, and again, during this time, man, the ship wasn't stopping. Like we were getting down Bradley's more and more. Like there was one point, uh, it, like we couldn't, we were almost combat ineffective because, you know, we didn't have enough Bradleys to go. We couldn't carry our dismount. So we started like literally walking out of our gate to go patrol and just kept this small little area. Had a couple of Bradleys burned to the ground. Uh, it was wild, man. And so then you lose the six, you're still getting attacked. Uh, and we're like, man, we got Coon to rally around. Right Coon was the, you know, he, he saved you know, temporarily the dude's life before we left and these other two guys. And it was early April. I got wind that Kuhn was having a tough time with things that maybe he could have done more or should have done more. So I called him to my room and uh big kid man, six, four, all jacked up and kind of another like Sergeant Green kind of like, you know, the type, 
as a soldier, he was a pain in my ass, just always getting in trouble, smart ass. But the dude was fucking stud, man. So like, buddy, give me all the shit you want, man. Because yeah. as long as you're out doing that, I, I can put up with it. Yeah. So uh, so I looked up at him and just said, man, you know, I hear you're having a tough time with things. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, and I said, buddy, let me tell you, man, you know, 20, 22 years old, 23 years old, whatever it was. Uh, I was like, three families have had an opportunity to spend last moments <clears throat> with their boy because of what you did. You know, Joseph's family before you left. I mean, you, you know, uh, Sergeant Green, while he may have been out, he could at least, you know, uh, they were able to hold the phone next to his ear so his mom, Linda, could talk to him. And, uh, you know, Sergeant Green, Sergeant Lightner was able to spend time with his family. So, you know, things didn't work out the way we wanted, but... In our line of work, people don't get a lot of second chances like that. So for what you've done for those three families, man, you've accomplished more in your lifetime than most people ever will. So hold your head high the rest of your life, buddy. He just kind of nodded and said thanks. And uh, so, yeah, man, you talk about a kick in the nuts. A little over 12 hours after that, he was shot and killed by an enemy sniper. Coon was. Yeah. God damn. Uh, similar type of operation where you're just out driving around? Just out just driving around and stopped to secure this one area. There's a platoon out there. And, uh, yeah, they were kids running up, trying to get for candy, and he leaned out of the gunner's seat and shooting the kids away. And uh, there was a pretty big sniper threat who had relatively left us alone for the most part up to that point. But, uh, yeah, they got him that day. And so he wasn't killed instantly. And, uh, you know, man, it was... Uh, just and, and again, he was so well respected uh, amongst all the men. And so when the call came with the radio, I knew something was bad. Because the guy that called in was like the toughest son of a bitch. This guy, Chris Holsey, in the company, and it was just like, you know, we're heading in. Call the medevac, and I was like, what's going on? You know, well, I need to know something. And he's just like, it's Coon. He's hurt. He's hurt real bad. And for and you got to know this guy, Chris. Man, it's. To kind of hear a little shake in his voice, uh, I'd never heard that before. So they came pulling in, and uh, he told us it was a head wound, but he was still alive. And so because of what had happened, and again, how respected it was, we kind of did the, we had a makeshift uh, aid station. As it turned out, the the colonel who led it was happened to be attached to us for a day. He was out there. So we got the aid station ready and called the bird. And we took all the guys and said, get inside. We don't want y'all to see this. And so me and a couple of the senior guys, one of the platoon sergeants and a couple of the squad leaders, we met the Humvees when they came in and uh, pulled them out. And so one guy grabbed one leg. And again, he's a big kid. One guy grabbed another leg. And so I reached up like under his arms. And he had a you know bandage around his head. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's just making this just this god awful sound man it's like a human body should make this and uh so we're carrying him in and it's kind of hot he's slipping around so i move my hands up and uh the bandage comes off his head and try to catch it and then you just see you know it's just just a huge you know it's just right here and i'm sending a lot of stuff and uh so we get him in and at this point you're like you know you don't you don't want him to make it you know he's not going to but you don't want him to because for that big and strong of a man to see you know, what you could see that he was, if he made it, would be a vegetable or something. But that tough son of a bitch, man, he, he made it through and the bird came and uh, we went and, you know, carried him out there and the bird drove off or flew off. And, uh, you know, me and the guys that were doing all the moving around, you know, we just kind of look at each other and say, you know, let's, let's get the men together, but let's all, uh, let's all go clean ourselves up first because we're all covered in shit. So I went over to my bathroom and, you know, man, you're just you're just numb in a situation like that, man. Like I had so I remember it like it happened right before I got here. I mean, it's that vividly. But uh, at the same time, it seems like a different experience. And uh, so yeah, so I'm just this numb feeling, and you know, washing my hands and my face, and like just picking stuff off and throwing. It's just almost surreal, like not registering, you know, what I'm doing and. Uh, so yeah, so then I feel this burning sensation on my face and, uh, you know, I kind of look up and look in the mirror and I see, and it's, it's not a gash or anything, but it's a thin cut and it's kind of going by my nose here, up sort of towards my ear. And I see a little bit of blood seeping out of it and I'm just, 
like, you know, what, what the hell type deal. And then I started feeling that and it was from the soap when I was washing my face and the soap in my hands and I started feeling it. And then I kind of looked down and when I did, it just like, like that came to, and I looked down and I had little pieces of a skull were stuck in my hands from carrying them in. I guess when I'd wipe the sweat off my face, I'd cut myself open and, uh, yeah, man, that was, uh, that, that moment right there was like sent me into a bad spot for almost five years after that. At what point, uh, or how, how long did, did it take for you to gain enough composure to be able to circle the fucking boys up and, and tell them what had happened? Right away. I mean, I, it was, I, I, and again, I remember it so clearly. <clears throat> I just remember looking at it myself in the mirror and it was almost like in real life. It's like feeling that image searing itself into my memory. And, and I just remember, I just went, what the fuck, man? Yeah. And then I'm like, all right, we got a job to do. And so then I went out and we got the men together and said, you know, basically what, like guys, I, I, none of us, we don't think he's gonna make it. As soon as I hear something, I'm expecting a phone call any minute. And then sure enough, about an hour after that, I got the phone call and he had passed. Yeah. yeah. Is that something that uh, similarly to any of the other experiences or, or contrasted maybe, uh, is that something that you think about often? And it, when I say it sent me into a bad spot for a few years, like starting that day for almost five years after that, like I did anything and everything in my power to not look into a mirror. Because uh, if I did, I didn't see me. I saw that image and I heard that sound in my head. Uh, if I saw a tall blonde kid anywhere, I heard that sound in my head. And yeah, man, I, I never, it, it happened. And I got back to my room that night uh, <clears throat> and I called a buddy of mine, a guy named Jason Tucker, lives here, DFW area. And uh, not a military guy, just probably the, the single best human being that I know. And I called him and uh, he said, man, are you okay? And I said, no, yes, but no. And I said, man, I'm just gonna say something out loud and I don't want you to say, are you okay? Everything all right? You know, man, I'm sorry. I said, just let me say it and then don't say a word after that because this is just one of those things I think I have to acknowledge. <clears throat> you know, for me, that seemed like a pretty not normal life experience. Uh, and so <clears throat> I start talking, I tell them what I just told you. And that dude, you just talk about, man, the definition of an awesome friend is, uh, we got done when he could tell I was done, he kind of 10, 15 second pause. And he's a big Florida state fan like I am. And they just had their spring game and just being nails that he is, man. He goes, well, man, uh, Weatherford looks like he's going to be our starting quarterback next year. And, uh, pretty excited about team, man. Uh, so go Knowles. That's how we always ended our calls. Yeah. And, uh, and we never talked to We never spoke about that for, it was probably almost five years after that when I brought it up to him and he's like, man, I have thought of that moment every single day <clears throat> since then. But you always said when I'm ready, I'll talk to you. And so I've always respected that. Yeah. What was it? Uh, five years later, was there a, a transition, a pivot point, a, an instance that took place that, uh, <clears throat> allowed you to let it go or process it or fucking whatever. Yeah. You know, it's, I came back, you know, the split officially happened. We didn't get divorced right away, uh, but they stayed. And I'd taken a job in Colorado, her and, you know, I left this three month old. I come home to this 18 month old toddler. We spent a year together, but I traveled a lot for work and then moved to Colorado. And basically once we got to Colorado, we realized it wasn't going to work. So she took Cole, my boy, back to Austin. And uh, so, yeah, man, I, it wasn't drugs or alcohol or nothing. I mean, I, I still drink beer like as much as the next guy, but I didn't abuse anything like that. I just, just went dark and was the biggest hypocrite in the world, man. Guys were struggling. We had our first suicide. Uh, so we ended up, so back at, so that Coon was the seventh guy. We lost one more guy two months after that, uh, Caleb Christopher, his similar, vehicle. Similar uh, ID or what? He was EFP, yeah. yeah, straight to the turret, direct hit on him. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty bad, bad thing. And then I, I left command uh, halfway through that deployment and just wrote it out on staff. What, let's talk about that for a second. Two things. Um, yeah. You guys continue to do basically those same operations. Um, yeah. If I'm putting myself in either your shoes or your guy's shoes, I have to be thinking, who the fuck is running the show to where we're just continuing to go out there and do the same 
things that are getting yeah. our guys killed. Was that addressed? Was that thought of, talked about? Yes. And you get the, you know, to me, it was, we got to do things kind of a different way. Uh, things did get, and some of it was because I was combat ineffective. I didn't have any Bradleys left. So we had to start doing more stuff dismounted. Uh, I got, and again, I got to give my old boss some credit. I got a little more aggressive in how we did some things. Uh, there's a big thing, like you can't shoot a main gun round in the city of Baghdad unless you have, you know, colonel level approval. Who in the middle of a firefight is going to, hey, bad guys, hold on a second. Let me call and ask dad if I can shoot this thing. And so we started, you know, if they would hit us with an EFP or have some little small ambush after that, you know, it used to be like we didn't always have someone to fire back at. And so it was, uh, you know, hey, let's, uh, let's send a message and we're not supposed to do that but you know, it was, we knew the area enough to know we knew which buildings were uh, abandoned and uh, yeah so shot a main gun round one day and you know from a morale standpoint that was like cool and then the guys were like we're shooting back we're doing something back and then stuff really picked up on the Iranian side then we started doing uh, a lot more security stuff for uh, the CAD guys and even some CIA dudes came in one time. And again, I, I was involved in the stuff. I met a few of them. Most of it was all just over the net. But it kind of changed and gave us a little bit of a sense of we're not out driving around all the damn time. Uh, but when that, we still had to do some of those. And uh, and again, I'm 10 years out now. No one can get mad at me. It was, guys, you're going to be out there for eight hours and you're going to be sitting right outside our gate for seven and a half of that type deal. Yeah. You, know, you know, just... And that may be a little exaggerated, but it was, we're not going to drive around and get blown up anymore type deal. Yeah. Um, is there an element of you and your guys that uh, harbor animosity towards leadership for having you do that to this day? Uh, oh, there, there are, yes. And, you know, I, I, I've spoken with my former boss, and uh, actually not that long ago. And did we have a great relationship? No, but... Uh, there is some false narratives about things that I, I wasn't crazy about the way he led decisions he made. You know, he had people to answer to as well. Uh, I've spoken to him. He has a lot of the same frustrations I do. Uh, but I'm very comfortable saying, I'm not going to come out and say I like the guy. I, I have a, a certain level of respect for the position he was put in. Uh, I don't think he's a bad man. Uh, I don't know if he was... And I'm not even going to say he wasn't a great leader. He wasn't a great leader for us or the right leader for us. But I'm 100% comfortable saying the men and the families hate him. Yeah. What do you suppose his um, perspective on you and the guys are? Do you suppose deep down he feels responsible or do you think he's just shirking it? Or No, I think he, he bears you know, the, the burden of command. Uh, I, I don't doubt that. I don't think he's told me that in you can hear it in a man's voice when they're sincere. He uh, has told you that? Yeah. 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 That he he doesn't shy away from the responsibility of, you know, one of the things I tell people is, you know, when you, you know, one of the things that made it tough for me coming home was, you know, when you make decisions and people die from that, you can objectify it all you want. Uh, but you make 99 decisions and you only think about the one bad one. Uh, and I think he, he, he feels the same way that, his decisions led to me having to make decisions, uh, but yeah, he is not a uh, not a well thought of man. Yeah, amongst the the team. Has there been any uh, animosity directed towards you from the guys? No, I mean I'm sure there's a few out there that you always got. Uh, there's always know. somebody to motherfuck you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean I know there was, <clears throat> you know, I took pride in. When I was a platoon leader, I didn't want my company commander, who was a great dude, by the way, I didn't want him breathing over my neck, going on all my missions all the time. Like, Let me go do my thing. Yeah. If it's a company mission, you're in charge. You know, this platoon mission, I'm in charge. Well, over there, it, it was all platoons, half platoons. So most of the time when I went out, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm going to be a rifleman for a day. Sergeant Green, you're my team leader, you know. Uh, so I didn't, with that, I probably didn't go out as much as some of the people. And there is, you know, some of the guys that were like, oh, sir, it's pussy, you know, doesn't want to go out. And that wasn't it. I'm like, no, I'm not going to go out and breathe over. You know, if I need to, I will. And if it's a company mission, yeah, I'll lead that, lead that every time. Uh, but I think as a whole, I, early on, I thought there would be some animosity. There were some reunions and 
gatherings the first few years that I did not go to because I was concerned that if I got there, and especially when alcohol gets involved, that it could people's people always want to look for something to blame. Yeah, and I just thought that I would be the target. And as the years have gone on, some of the things that we've done to <clears throat> honor the men, uh, I, I would like to think the the larger majority. Uh, and I hold each other in high regard. Have you been to any of the reunions? Since? Oh yeah, every year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Heck, I, I host half of them now. So yeah. how uh, how how is that getting together with all the guys? Oh, dude, it's uh, it's the guys, it's the families. Like Sergeant Green's mom, Linda Kagan. This lady is, I mean, she's cleaning her mouth up now, and she's a but chain smoking, <laughs> f bomb dropping. Uh, even though she quit smoking too, go Linda. <laughs> Uh, she's just the best, man. I mean, all the families are. Uh, I mean, there's so many just, uh, and we've all connected and got them connected. And, you know, it sounds kind of hokey, but, you know, when this went down, you know, we all made a promise, like, we're not going to forget your boy. And everybody does in that situation. But life goes on, and, and right or wrong, you know that some people do, and they do forget that promise. And yeah. and we haven't. And that's something that we take an immense amount of pride in. Yeah, no, that's, that's really neat. Um, you mentioned after the last... The, the eighth guy under your command essentially uh, was killed that you rode the rest of the time out as a, in a staff position. Is yeah. It, um, yeah. Was there, was that voluntary? Was it dictated? What, what was the no, reason behind that? My time was up. In fact, I was supposed to change command before May of 2007, uh, they, just because of everything that was going on. Cause they like, Hey, you get, you know, 15 to 18 <clears> months in command. And I ended up getting 19 because they kept me in a few extra months because all the shit had gone down and they didn't want to change command. In fact, the eighth guy, I changed command and the eighth guy was killed right after that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how was coming home after that uh, that deployment? Oh, man. Uh, just uh, dark. You know, I said I was going to come home. The marriage was on the rocks again. And... Uh, you know, I was like, you know, that boy, that's going to be the thing that I, I rally around and kind of gets me back to being me. And uh, you asked earlier, was it a singular moment? This is all kind of lead up to it. I know we've kind of skipped around, but yeah, man, I just just went dark. I uh, was a hypocrite. I gave all the right advice, told everybody to get help and talk to people and don't be pent up. But I did the exact same thing. I kind of like stayed in that command mode, I guess. And, you know, the the leader you know, has to be healed in order to, to help heal others. And I was as far removed as being healed as possible. I was marriage on the rock, rocked with survivor's guilt, uh, that image, the whole coon thing in my head. Yeah, I mean, I was a, it was a hot mess. Looking back on it, do you feel a sense of responsibility for um, any of that happening where... Um, I don't know, I guess, do you feel responsible in not pushing back and saying, hey, this is fucking stupid. We're not We're not doing this. Like, fire me if you need to. Like, yeah. I guess, you know, obviously I, I wasn't in the Army. I, I, you know, we worked with plenty of those guys off and on, but not enough to, like, I know that there's elements in the SEAL teams where that shit happens, mm -hmm. you know, where a group of enlisted guys would be like, hey, chief, go fuck yourself. We're not doing this one. It's fucking yeah. dumb. Yeah. You know, like fire us then you know but it, it doesn't happen very often but there there are times and I, I remember one of them in particular in uh in a deployment to iraq that, that i can think of where where that essentially happened where it was like i don't know who the fuck's telling you to do this but you need to go slap the shit out of him and tell him to pull his head out of his ass because that's dumb as fuck yeah um you know so what what, what, I guess what you know in your position at that time was that something that you thought about was it something that you tried to bring up was it something that you know if you had it would have been worse I mean what what do you what can you kind of expound on that yeah I mean to answer your original question <clears throat> of, of course I do like you go back to that day to the whole point of having to do the photo op I did I, I pushed I pushed to the point of no we're not doing it uh I could always go back and say you could push harder. You know, to me it was kind of a win of man. I, I got half the guys to be able to stay home. Uh, you know, some of the other things, the events that happened, they were hard to. They were sort of just day to day. There were stuff that went on where, you know, it was like, sir, no, that's fucking crazy. No, you know, we're not going to do that. And so yeah, I, it, those conversations maybe not to the. Uh, there was one time where I, it was actually after I left command 
when something came up and I was in the operations office and I was just so against something that I just said, well, I, I can't be on the, the net running that. And if that's the case, then you probably need to send me to brigade headquarters or something because I won't, I won't be a part of that. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, it wasn't anything dangerous or foolish. It was probably, I was a little scarred, but it was something that basically it involved something else with a photo op. And I was just like, fuck that. Yeah. All right. So you come home pretty dark spot, <clears throat> not taking your own advice. Um, yeah. was your wife at the time, um, was she empathetic to where you were at or did it just cause more problems? Just caused more problems. Uh, it did. And, and, and we have a great relationship now, uh, co-parent very well, you know, back then things weren't so good for her. It was, <clears throat> you, you got to paint the, you know, she understood and she was empathetic for what I had been through and felt bad for me, but it's, but you're away from all that. Now you're back here with me. Why can't you just forget that stuff and focus on all this and us and just without having the context of, uh, you know, likewise, like I couldn't be in Iraq and put myself in her shoes of like, man, that must suck being home alone, you know, first yeah. time mom. You know, there's just some things that, uh, yeah, I mean, we just went. Maybe, maybe you both resent each other a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You should feel more bad for me and, you know, no, you for me. And then before you know it, you're in some stupid pissing match that yeah. no one wins. Yeah. Uh, so you guys end up ultimately splitting up. Yeah, yeah. So we, so that first year back, I traveled a lot. Uh, the job was basically travel for a year, learn the business, then re-interview within the company. And what was this? Uh, medical sales. I was doing medical sales. They had this leadership and training program. Uh, it was a great way designed for military to give you a year transition from, you know, you don't have a whole lot of responsibility. Just, hey, man, here's some money. Go learn for a year. I don't suppose you're selling ventilators now, are you? <laughs> You'd be on the fucking Bahamas if you were right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 We'd be doing this remote from my yacht. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, man. It was uh, so at the end of that year, we interviewed for the permanent territory and went to uh, and moved out to Colorado and got out in Colorado and that's when they joined me and just sort of realized like this isn't going to work and so that would have been '09 when all this was uh was going down uh, around fall of '09 and then we hadn't sold our house in Austin yet. She's like, well, I would rather keep the house. And I'm like, all right, well, you guys just go back there and then I'll do a little bit of time out here. Then I'll find something down in Austin and get back down there to be closer to Cole. And uh, so yeah, I ended up spending about a year and a half. So that was, I guess, the official we split was November of 09. Yeah. And, uh, so from then until the, the point at which you were able to let go, um, you know, the, the dark period of your life, can you... Can we go back to that and yeah, yeah. So it was like, yeah. was there a defining moment where? Yeah. So after those years of just again, put the act on nine to five. I had a good job. I was making good money, and you know, things looked good on paper. You were uh, still dark in a dark. Oh spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And left Colorado, moved to uh, Tyler, Texas, in September of 2010 to be a little bit closer to coal. I'd never been to Tyler, but they said we have an opening, so I'll take it. And uh, same thing there. Didn't try to meet anybody. Just stuck to myself and so as I, I went home to Florida to see my mom and stepdad and two of my brothers in uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, Christmas of 2011 so almost five years <clears throat> and feel free to give me all the shit you want for this but every man listening to the show will appreciate it and my mom had always had this phrase of you know these are her words not mine you know like oh my baby's big blue eyes they're just the the light of my life and Anytime I'm down or sad, I just look in those eyes and I know that everything's going to be okay. I mean, she said to me as a little kid. <clears throat> and so, have dinner, sit down on the couch, grab a beer, and she looks at me and she just starts crying. And I'm like, man, she's got some bad health news or something. And it takes her a few minutes to get herself together. And I'm like, mom, what's going on? And she just goes, it's gone. The light's gone. And, uh, when I look at my baby, I don't see the light anymore. I see that you look dead inside and it just breaks my heart that there's nothing I can do to change that. And it's something you're going to have to figure out on your own. But for the first time in my life, I don't think everything's going to be okay. Wow. And so that was kind of a, a kick in the nuts. And like, 
you know, and, and there had been, you know, small instances here and there along the way of like, man, I'm not me. I'm not the guy that's outgoing, trying to make a difference, you know, take stand up for those that can't take stand up for themselves. But they were just flittering moments here and there. But something about her saying that, man, just hit me like a ton of bricks. So I went back out to Tyler and said, you know what, I'm going to take my own advice. So I went to counseling and I was just very open about this guilt that I carried and uh, decisions I had made and uh, images I couldn't get out of my head. I'm assuming that that counseling helped. It did. You know, it's, I mean, there's some things you look back. It, to me, it goes back to just one simple phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, that he said. And we were talking about the mirror incident. And he said, uh, he's like, man, have you accepted that, Jeff? And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know, I, I, I said, yeah, I guess, man, I guess as much as you can accept something like that. He was like, no, stop and think back for a second. When you say you have this image, when you look into a mirror, is it the image looking at you or is it almost like you're back from afar looking at it? And I said, man, I've never thought of it that way, but it's almost like that, like I'm looking at myself, looking in the mirror. And he's like, well, that just means that you haven't accepted it. And Jeff, whatever it is we get into, he's like, we can't deal with things unless they're real and things aren't real until we accept them. So we have to literally and figuratively get you back to where you can look into a mirror again. But that whole thing about the acceptance, man, just uh, just resonated with me. And he never tried to like pitch wisdom. It was just more kind of let me talk and figure it out. And then, uh, yeah, one day I just came. One day I said, man, I think I got it. You know, and the, yeah, and some pretty shitty things happened to me in my life, not just in the military and other aspects. Uh, but you know, and I can't control a lot of that. But I can control my choice of how I'm going to uh, approach life every day. And you know, acceptance is not a one-time deal. I don't sit on your couch today and say, I'm good, you know. Uh, but what I can do every day is wake up and make the choice that, uh, you know, I can focus on the privilege of these experiences and this brotherhood and these men and, and things that I've been able to do uh, or the burden of some of those things that I was a part of. And uh, it taught me to 9.9 out of 10 days, I make the right choice and focus on the privilege. Yeah. How big of a role has uh, having founded the the organization to to honor these men? How big of a role has that played in your ability to continue to do that? Yeah, man, I think that was actually probably the thing that really. Uh, so all this was going on early 2012. One of the things he told me he was like, "Man, you should share some of these experiences with your friends." And I had just started doing CrossFit, and the only people I was meeting in Tyler were CrossFit people. So one night. And they knew they saw all my tattoos and they knew something, but they never asked out of respect. And uh, so I opened up that night, took me a beer or 10 to get the courage to do it, but I did it. And uh, one of the guys said, well, man, let's do a, let's do a hero wad for them. And I referred to the men as a Legion eight uh, when I was talking about it. So we called the wad Legion eight and it was just going to be a handful of us do it one day, kind of a little memorial thing for me and the families owners of the gym got wind of it and they said hey would you mind let's make an event out of this and invite people and maybe you kind of talk for a little bit and scared chip was doing it uh but yeah so got up there and uh we did that in july of 2012 and that was and linda sergeant green's mom said it perfect like all the gatherings before everybody had tears in their eyes and this was the first day we were all together and we all had a smile on our face it mm -hmm. was just like something lifted off our shoulders and you know, so then it was, we're doing this again next year, right? And the next year, three gyms did it. The next year, 10, then 50, then places all over the country. And then it was, I mean, we should probably go the nonprofit route with this. And let's, you know, what, what better way to honor the men and honor that promise that we made to their families than to take this thing and, and scale it and make it sustainable and support uh, veterans organizations that support things that are important to us, but also, you know, I'll go do a speech and then someone will come up and share their worst experience in life. It's not a veteran. And it just taught me that tragedy and trauma, they don't discriminate and PTSD is not exclusive <clears throat> to the military. And if I can use these men's story and their memory as a way to make a positive impact in many people's lives, then what better way to honor that promise than that? Yeah. How, uh, how big of a kick in the dick is the workout? It sucks balls. What, what, is, what is it? So it's uh, obviously the theme is eight. Uh, it was funny you get to it. So I'll tell you the workout, then I'll tell you the backstory behind it. So the theme is eight. So it was eight rounds, and it's eight movements, and it's eight reps of each. And it's uh, thrusters, uh, chest-to-bar, clapping push-ups, high pulls, some snatch, 
uh, knees to elbow and uh, handstand push-ups. And then once you do all eight rounds, and then you do an 800 meter run Jeez. at the end. And so, you know, in our, our slightly drunken mind, so if I was 10 beers in to get the story, by the time we got to creating the workout, we were all much further along. So the next day, you know, we had this workout and we passed it off to our coach, who's this dude's awesome shape. He's like, all right, man, this looks like it may be kind of tough. Let me try it out. And he called me and I was like, dude, are you done already? He's like, dude, I just did four rounds and I'm dead. He's like, this will kill most people. So we lowered the weight a ton and changed a few movements up. Uh, most people split it a lot like Murph. Uh, it's kind of, it's, I think the best time I've ever heard of a, uh, just an individual doing it is like mid thirty minutes time frame. It takes yeah. me in the uh, couple of days. Yeah, yeah now it is. <laughs> the great thing is now I'm like, you know, I've done it so many times now. I'm like, guys, like, my job's not to do the work, man. I've honored the boys enough. I'm gonna walk around, shake hands, raise money. I'm yeah. gonna watch you guys work out. Yeah, yeah, that's great shit. Um, it, it sounds like a great organization, both in um, in premise and in in action. I, I love to hear about it. Uh, so what are, what are you doing now? Are you still in the medical sale thing, or or what what was the transition from that into what you're doing now? Yeah, that's no, so why I did the sales and uh, and then switched companies back in 2016 and kind of left the customer facing piece of it and went back. I kind of wanted to round out my overall business acumen and see how things work behind the team behind the scenes. Uh, so went and led a team of Six Sigma black belts and internal consultants uh, for. Uh, McKesson Corporation, big pharmaceutical distributor, and uh, did that for a few years. Great experience, and then I left them about nine months ago uh, and moved over to the financial services in industry. And uh, so I run operations for uh, the company I work for. We have several brands around the country, and I run ops for our largest brand. Just can you talk about? Can you say what brand it is? Or yeah, not? yeah. It's uh, it's Ace Cash Express. Is the so the company I work for is Populous Financial Group. And Ace, you know, it's, it gets a, and I had the same thing, a very negative stigma of, oh, payday lending, you're taking advantage of people. And, you know, and I'm not here to change anybody's mind or defend it, but, you know, there's people, and I think one of the things that resonates with me is, you know, if my mom would have had a service like that, we wouldn't have had the electricity cut off, yeah. you know, 30 years ago when I was a kid. So people do need that. Uh, it's an ethical company, not always. I mean, there's bad apples in every industry. Yeah. I am curious, given the, the current uh, economic climate with the coronavirus, this, I mean, this will air within probably a week. It may even be even worse. Uh, how uh, panicky is, is your leadership right now, given given what's going on? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, my kids aren't in daycare right now. A lot of our workers, we have almost a thousand stores around the country. And what if those people can't go to work? Then we can't open our doors. How do we do that? Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, and on the flip side of that is there could be, uh, we have to be prepared, you know, say they send out these thousand dollar checks to people. Well, a lot of people won't have a traditional bank to go to, to get it. They got to have some place. So we have to make sure that, you know, we have people employed there or stores that are open and cash on hand to be able to provide for these customers so they can go take care of the essential needs for their families. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, uh, it's a crazy fucking time for sure. No, yeah. no two ways about it. Um, all right, so that's what you're up to now. Is there anything that you can share looking back on it now, now that you've been out a while? Um, you know, you went through what you went through with these guys. You lost the men that you did. We're in a dark place for several years. It sounds like you've come out of that pretty well, and you're doing a, a really good job at honoring these guys and keeping their memory alive. Anything else you can kind of share looking back on it kind of collectively? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we talked about March 15th. You know, that was just the other day, and that's obviously, you know, how anniversaries are for things like this. And a lot of people check on me now, and I think it was probably the year 10 switch, 10 mark, where things flipped. And it's it's always going to be a sad day. I mean, you can't, again, can't polish a turd. Uh, not just that day, but any of these days. Uh, but I think now I've learned to accept that I can't change what happened. I can't change decisions I've made. Uh, what I can do is to continue uh, to think, to, I, I'd like to think, to set an example for not just myself, but, you know, the other men from the unit, men from other units, the families, for anybody that cares about our organization or about hearing our story, or any of your listeners, to set an example that, you know, it is possible to take something bad and turn it into something good. And I think sometimes 
one of the greatest gifts that we have as humans is the ability to inspire someone that, you know, someone can look at you and say, you know what, if he can do it, so can I. Yeah. And again, everybody's got shit, man. Everybody's got a story. And, uh, you know, I wasn't a SEAL. I wasn't a CAD guy. I was a conventional army guy. Yeah, I wanted to do all those things. And just life didn't work out. Uh, but, you know, I'm a normal guy. And if that, I, I didn't ask for this platform in life, but life gave it to me. And so uh, what am I going to do with it? And uh, I want to do something good. Yeah. It's a, it's a hell of a story. Um, I said I've read almost all the book. I, I intentionally, usually when there's books like this, leave the kind of actions on out so that my response is uh, is authentic. Not that it's bullshit without it, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, the book, I appreciate you sending it to me. It's called Legion Rising. Um, I'm going to hold it up for the YouTube folks. Is this available on Amazon? Yeah, Amazon? yeah, yeah, on Amazon, yeah. yeah. Uh, very well written. Um, and I, yeah, I just... I like the the way that you go through it and and uh, kind of talk about the things and the impacts that it has on you. It's uh, just, it's a good read. It's an easy read and uh, and it's worthwhile. So I, I strongly recommend you guys uh, pick it up and, and check it out. There's a lot of other details in there um, that contribute to his story that uh, that we didn't talk about uh, kind of on purpose. But um, where can people find um, the Legion 8 uh, Foundation in terms of helping support or being a part of it or, or what have you? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I kind of mentioned it to you before we went on air. I've kind of purposely kept it small, controllable right now. Just, uh, again, I got a full-time job to take care of four kids. And yeah, I guess people want, just yeah, want the, to donate. Yeah, and, yeah, so we want to donate. I just, uh, I say that the, the goal is to make this thing a lot bigger, a lot better. Uh, you know, so we have a website, it's Legion 8, and it's the number 8.org. Uh, there's a Facebook page for it, Legion 8. It's pretty easy to find. If you Google it, there's uh, different articles about it, and there's some, some pretty cool, the backstory, kind of how it came to be. Uh, so, yeah, those are the best of the website and Facebook. Yeah, okay. And we have an online store, too, on the face. i got to update this year's logo. I gave you the shirt, but we got some pretty cool gear and you can go back and get the different logos oh, for each of the years. Yeah. yeah cool. And w- when do you guys do the wad on March 15th or no, we, we started, we did it in July the first year and then it was too damn hot and doing yeah. that shit in Texas. Like people were passing out. So then we moved it to the April time frame, and then two things. One, it just started growing and I wanted to get to as many as we could possibly be, you know, be at to speak and tell the story. Uh, and two, uh, my wife, we had kids and back to back to back, you know, basically yeah. <laughs> spring time frame. And so, again, as a way to scale it, uh, I started asking everybody to do it on Labor Day. You know, you got Memorial Day Murph and yeah. it kicks off the summer. You know, everybody does a hero lot on Labor Day, but no one really owns that day. So my take on it is my little, you know, my little own slogan that I came up with <clears> is <throat> kick the summer off with Memorial Day Murph and end it with Labor Day Legion 8. Yeah, that's cool. I like it. Well, good shit. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. It's a hell of a story. Um, you know, my heart goes out to you and your men and the family members of, of the fall. And it is, is a pretty gut wrenching story to, to hear, um, you know, and, and it, uh, you know, I, I think it strikes, you know, I don't know, emotion out of anybody, frankly, mm-hmm. listening to it. I know, you know, just for me sitting here listening to it, it certainly did to me and and you can you know hear it in your voice and it's a it's a story that is uh, both sad uh, but also impactful in terms of um you know being a lot of good uh, life lessons in terms of how it impacts you moving forward and and the reality that our our soldiers face and i think sometimes especially listeners because I, i have so many you know soft guys on here special operations guys that um, that it gets a little over inundated with that. And, and it's really nice to hear a, a more conventional side um, and, and hearing, you know, that, that war is, is every bit as fucking catastrophic and difficult and tumultuous and heartbreaking and dangerous and, and everything uh, I, I think is important for people to hear. And, and uh, I know that people will uh, <clears throat> appreciate the fact that you came on and, and shared your, your incredible story. So thank you for sharing it. Um, anything you want to want to add before we wrap up? No, man. Just thank you for having me. I mean, this oh, is yeah. a uh, you know obviously a, a biggest platform I've been on, and you know I, when the book was getting published, and all these publishers and my agent, who's awesome, thank you, Chip. Uh, 
he's like, man, Jeff, everyone loves your book, but they're like, who the hell's this guy? No one's ever heard of him. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so uh, it's, it's a, it's a big platform for me. So I'm very appreciative and thank you. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure to have it, have you on. I'm, I'm just the boob behind the, <laughs> behind the microphone letting you talk. Yeah. So, and as we wrap up here, I want to take another quick second to thank our sponsor, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Uh, Jocko Fuel has a number of products that go, the Discipline, the Krill Oil, the Joint Formula, or Joint Warfare Formula, uh, and they just came out with a, a Cold War uh, formula to help with uh, immune support and fighting off colds and viruses. Especially good in this time. Uh, Origin Labs also makes geese uh, to grapple in, jeans that massage your ass while you wear them, uh, as well as some really nice uh, leather boondocker style boots that uh, that are pretty fucking sharp. So. Uh, lots of good American-made products. Uh, Jocko's a huge part behind uh, all of them, uh, and they've been a huge sponsor and supporter of the Mic Drop Podcast, so big shout-out. Thanks to them. Go pick up their stuff. Uh, for the listener, uh, as always, I appreciate your support. Um, go out and check uh, Jeff's book out. Again, it's called Legion Rising, and uh, support uh, the foundation if you have the means to do so. Uh, in these times, we're looking to crank out a number of episodes uh, this month. I know a lot of people have some downtime. Uh, keep your fucking heads about you. Um, the, it for sure will pass. And, uh, you know, not to say that it's not, uh, you know, something to take lightly, but, uh, you know, worry about the things that you can fucking control uh, and don't worry about the things that you can't. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Ultimately, I am, as always, uh, super appreciative and grateful for your support. Uh, without it, I wouldn't be sitting here doing uh, doing this. So uh, thank you for all the listeners. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.